everyone thanks for your attendance this morning for the session on geo strategy and world trade a couple in crisis for 30 years the world has known as an, an exponential growth which uh, led to a threefold augmentation of um, people getting out of poverty this translated into in 2023 with an estimate where the growth rate would reach 1% only after 3.5% in uh, 2022. Commercial tensions multiply the pandemic, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the supply chain being interrupted, the deglobalization, fragmentation, decoupling, French and reshoring. These are the words that we hear today when we hear about world trade. So we're going to have people shedding light on the situation. We have Mr. Bourinchas from the IMF, Saori Katada, who's the professor of international relation and director of the International Center of Study at the University of Southern California. Then we have Ming Bo Kai, who's from the Cafe Capital Investment Fund. Then we have the president of France of Chubb, Mr. Benoit Jassanier, and the former ambassador of France in the UK, uh, uh, China, and the US, Sylvie Berman. You have the floor, Pierre Jacquet. So to open this debate and to uh, enlarge it more further than the uh, uh, word uh, trade, because it's uh, difficult today to talk about this with the globalization, I would like to uh, give you three opportunities, two suggestions, first of all. We often uh, uh, mistake the interdependence and the lack of, of management. It is more and more present. We've uh, seen some increase as, to, as compared to 2022, which was catching up on the previous years. There's trade, there's the financial flows. These are subjects that we know, and we know the difficulty uh, leading to management. However, there are important strengths of interdependence. We have the new technologies, we have uh, IT, we have artificial intelligence. These uh, create a link between the populations. And we also have uh, global challenges because we know that the fight against climate change can only be a collective one. Besides this reality of interdependence that changes, that is changing, we have a relationship of interdependence that is in crisis because it relies on institutions and agreements that have become outdated with uh, due to the deep changes that have undergone we have emerging countries coming up but not only we have the large and great uh, financial crisis as well and which means that globalization as we know it doesn't exist anymore and doesn't allow us to manage the risks such as the um, uh, third world uh, debt crisis. And so it prevents us from talking about deglobalization. However, the management of globalization is in, is in crisis, and this is where there is an issue. Second proposal, the myth of uh, the happy, success, successful globalization is no longer applicable. When we say that globalization is good for everyone, it's not the case. We know that uh, some happy few benefit from it. Some uh, collectively, most countries do, but there are some uh, population groups that are not not uh, profiting from it, from not benefiting from it. This has this becomes a political problem, and hence the management is uh, to be at the forefront. So to have a successful globalization, we have to create a new form of a utopia that understands uh, the importance of collective action, and this is a fundamental issue. We have to change the narrative. We have to show how globalization can allow us to live better. And that implies an important role from the public uh, uh, powers and authorities. Besides that, globalization can seem at first a matter of international relationship and diplomacy, a matter of relationship between countries. 
But actually, fundamentally, it's a matter of domestic policy. We have to prove how we can at once combine the opening and its benefits with the management of its transitions that is imposed by globalization, partially not only because some other aspects play a role in the transformation of economy. Globalization adds is an easy scapegoat. But domestic policy is at the heart and is the one that is important if we, have, if we want to have a, po a, a positive narrative as to globalization. I'm stopping here. Thank you. I will start with Pierre-Olivier Bourinchas. You, can, you uh, are a consultant at the IMF. Where do we stand now? You do not talk about globalization. You talk about the risk of geoeconomic fragmentation. Can you talk about this? Yes, the hello. I would like to start by saying, where do we stand now? We are at the end of a cycle. As you have recalled, we are at a stage of intense globalization in our financial uh, uh, trade as well. That has allowed a rise in, of the emerging countries and hundreds of millions of individuals could get out of poverty. A middle class has emerged at the worldwide level. But behind this increase of trade, there was also a willingness to go beyond uh, the growth of uh, economic exchange. When the system is setting up at the end of the Second World War, international institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF were set up. The idea was that trade would allow a convergence of values that the society would improve and adopt more or less the, the same operating methods. That's a first, um, a first situation. We do not have a convention of values that coexist. We have different forms of organization of society. That's a first point. And at this stage being set, we see that it has become a threat, this diversity. This is what we sometimes call the, the, the trap of two CD. When we talk about the Peloponnese War, so that that gives more uh, importance to the world economy and the uh, governance and decision-making authorities. This is something that is difficult to implement. Another thing that recalled Pierre. We've had a globalization that was quite well controlled. We've had distribution efforts that were quite strong. And especially in countries in the advanced economy, we often talk about the China shock, the opening of international trade with China that has led to a form of poverty in regions that were more exposed to trade with China. And then we have a rise of populism on the right hand side of the political exchequer, we could fi find more space for the emerging countries and some want to protect the domestic population. So we have a form of alignment of populism, which is not uh, only to be found in the US, we find it uh, elsewhere as well. What we also have, the emerging countries themselves, they benefit from globalization that took place they would like to move forward and carry on, but not in a system which seems to be full of inequalities. So they want to have alternative mechanisms. We see, for instance, financing mechanisms for emerging countries between emerging countries like the, uh, the BRIC, for instance. And that's a, 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 an important trend. This is not only going up to five years ago. It, it is dating back and is due to last. It's like a shock, and especially the invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine shows how much there is a transition nowadays. The conflicts are unveiled, and we have to manage these tensions. That's the first point. We are at the end of a cycle, so we're entering a new cycle. And this new cycle is characterized by what we call at the IMF the geoeconomic fragmentation. We see a rising of tensions and restrictions with uh, regards to trade. And we wonder about the reconfiguration of these uh, commercial exchanges. 
For instance, we have rising ten, uh, sanctions on the use of technologies, the sharing of technologies that is an important vector of growth and convergence in the world. We see that there are restrictions in terms of uh, world trade between China and the US, but not only, with other countries as well. We see effects on investments on capital flows, for instance, in April. Uh, this is something we saw. The direct investment flows, and that has been the case for some years, but this has been rising, they are more and more determined by geo uh, political proximity uh, factors rather than geographic factors. Geopolitical uh, criteria are prevailing now on direct investment flows. And this is an important v vector of fragmentation and when we look forward. What we try to do is to measure the consequences of this geoeconomic fragmentation. We are trying to do scenarios to see what the world would look like if we were to have a worldwide fragmentation as during the Cold War. We could see how it would polarize. What is striking is that the economic cost is there. It's quite significant, but it's also quite asymmetric. In the studies that we carried out within the IMF, what we found out was that the cost was, the cost was disproportionate and relies on the emerging countries. These are the ones that will be the first victims, partially because they're very much open. So closing them up will, be, uh, will entail a lot of constraints. And they need uh, techno technological progress. And they have a lot to win from uh, world trade. This is what we see with the uh, current uh, developments. The last point, and then we'll go back to some of these subjects, but I don't want to uh, uh, keep the floor too long. Something that uh, my colleague has just said, we shouldn't over-dramatize the situation. We see this long-term trend. We have to be careful. And as an institutional, an, an international institution, we have to be the watchdog of the international economy. We have to make sure that it is as much productive and that it generates as many benefits as possible. So we want to uh, fight against this uh, uh, effect. But we are at the beginning of this process, and uh, commercial exchanges are quite uh, high. And I will give you an empiric observation, which is quite significant. When we talk about fragmentation, desegmentation of the world economy, we would think that there would be a Western bloc and a China-centered bloc with countries that are closer, uh, politically speaking, from ch to China. But when we see the commercial deficits in terms of balance of trade in 2022, well, the countries that had surplus that were, they were China, Russia, uh, oil uh, producing countries and those that had a deficit, namely those borrowing from these countries, were the Western countries. So we still have strong exchanges between these uh, different regions of the world. And I will stop here. Thank you, Pierre Olivier. I'm going to turn to Sylvie Berman. You are previous ambassador of France to UK, Russia and China. You were ambassador during the Brexit that was considered at the time as a, mat as a as a period of fragmentation and deglobalization. Pierre Olivier has mentioned the populism as a rejection of globalization. What is your experience? How do you perceive the current developments? Well, we present the topic of uh, the roundtable geostrategy and uh, world trade, a couple in crisis. But in reality, we have worked, uh, um, as Montesquieu said, uh, with soft trade, saying that when trade is smooth, then the morals are smooth as well. Everything goes along smoothly. But we've seen that this is not the case. We are at the end of a cycle, as was said, and we are at the end of, a di of an illusion. Uh, what that means that free trade, uh, we, we would think that free trade would favor democracy, and this is not the case. We would think that all countries would live according to the American system along the lines of uh, economic liberalism and democracy, and we see that the development is rather the reverse with the emergence of autocracy. Amongst the three countries where I have lived, I've seen the effects of trade 
in terms of uh, geostrategic evolution, the first of which is Brexit. It was a surprise for everyone, including for the Brexiters themselves in the UK. A lot of British were saying at the time, no risk. They would take Napoleon's formula. We are a nation of uh, shop retailers and the economy will prevail. And it was the opposite that uh, happened. We had reactions that were totally irrational, where the identity, the fear of immigration, the fear of uh, uh, the others uh, took over. And we had the Brexit. And we see year after year the impact it has on the economic issues. And this is what's uh, uh, ended this uh, smooth trade era. And uh, the UK was actually a symbol of this. It embodied this. We are somehow in a Cold War where the heart is precisely trade, economy, finance. And the first uh, triggering point was in 2019 when Trump announced sanctions against Huawei. Ubi and Orbi, I would like to say, because it concerns the US, but there was a lot of pressure on a lot of countries, including on UK, which had to forego using Huawei after having given, uh, uh, after having entered into an agreement with that company. So when we talk about Cold War, I saw it. I was in Moscow during the uh, Soviet Union, so I could see the end of the Cold War. It's, of course, it's completely different. The Soviet Union was not involved in the world economic flows as for China. However, it is the opposite. And I think that we are indeed in this trap of two CD that was mentioned by Graham Allison, which uh, led some Americans, Trump, but also the President Biden, in, in defining a policy of prohibitions in, to provide microprocessors to China, and that prevented its development. This is where we stand. Well, when we talk about restrictions, it's not totally a stumbling block, because when you have prohibitions, you are given an incentive to a country to find alternatives, and they uh, circumvent the problem, and they find better solutions. Of course, it takes more time, but that's the heart of this Cold War. Oh, uh, much beyond ideologies and, t and tariffs, because we know that the accident of China on uh, the US, despite this tariff war, was a record last year. So that's a subject that keeps uh, being topical right now, and it also regards uh, the European countries. It's not a total full-fledged war that is being waged, because on either side, we want to keep things peaceful. After visit of four days of Janet Yellen, for instance, Secretary of State uh, of American Trade, she obtained some outcomes. And even though there was no real breakthrough, there was a political will to make things more peaceful. And the decoupling with China would not be a solution. This is what was found out. This is what we often mention. The EU has a less violent formula when they talk about de-risking as uh, regards to China. And this has a lot of sense. It uh, was uh, seen during the health crisis. We depended on China for some strategic products. At the same time, and I won't talk about the Cold War, but the hot war at our door, we are in a period of reciprocal sanctions. And this was seen during the Cold War as well, the EU to defend itself from uh, these problems with China, because China used it often. There were some uh, reprisals from uh, on, uh, for the regalium and uh, rare metals. This was the case also with Japan in 2011 at the time of the conflict so as a response to some sanctions. So we are uh, playing a game of sanctions against sanctions. And they developed an anti-coercion uh, anti 
uh, tool to fight against these sanctions, but that's the logic uh, we are in. We have entered a, an endless system of back-to-back -back sanctions from uh, US to China, with Japan, Australia, and the EU. And this hot war being waged in Ukraine it was an eye-opener in terms of tensions. And the reaction, the first reaction, was to issue sanctions against Russia. Well, less involved into world trade, but still, Russia was the provider of gas, of low-cost gas, and Germany had built all its uh, energy supply chain around this. Its safety was uh, based on NATO and the US. For energy, it was based on uh, Russia, and trade was based on um, China, so it needed to uh, undergo a facelift. Uh, we are talking about die Wende. This was the word that was used by the German Chancellor. So they had to change their strategy and they are reviewing their whole uh, international policy. So we are at the end of a cycle of an illusion. We can't stay where we are. We have to build something else. We have to multiply uh, exchanges because trade is all about exchanges. And I will wrap up before my time is running out with a word which a Chinese word, which is Weiji, which is the first criteria, threat, and the second character is opportunity, because we have to renew hope here. Thank you. Benoit. I am turning to you, Benoit Chasseguet, country, country president for France. You see, uh, for Shab, you see very concretely the reconstruction of supply chains with your clients. Can you g give us a concrete explanation? Why do these reconfigurations mean to you? Yes. First of all, I'd like to greet uh, the people who are get the early birds uh, of this Sunday morning. I'd like to greet them all. Uh, I see a more practical side of globalization. And uh, the question is de-globalization or globalization. And I'd like to talk about what we call the supply chains, the logistics and the impact of the CO2 on that. Just to, to begin, do you know Malcolm McLean? Does that name ring a bell? I would be very surprised if anybody knew him. He revolutionized the trans worldwide uh, global transport because in the 50s he decided we were used to transporting goods you know, in bulk. We'd put them all in a boat and it would leave the, the, the country. And he decided to put all these goods in a box, a small box. And then he decided to put those boxes on a tanker. We're talking about, I'm talking about 1956, so 60 years ago. And there was 58 boxes on a tanker that left. It's in the U.S. It was it happened in the U.S. It was a freight forwarder. Uh, and since then, the goods uh, currently are represent 220 million containers shipped every day. So 5,000 boats going on the, the, the sea. 80 percent of uh, freight, global freight, happens on the sea. So this is not why we had uh, globalization, but this was the first start towards globalization. And the fact that he decided to put all the goods in a box, divided by 30 or 40, the uh, the transport costs, and that favored, of course, uh, globalization. And a, also promoted the just-in-time, which happened with Toyota later on, not to have storage in the country where the goods were consumed, but shipped there. And um, you can see all the forecasts for the years to come are quite big. We're talking about 200 million a day. In 10 or 15 years, we talk about 400 million a day. So the 5,000 boats that uh, would uh, sail in the sea, we started with a small boat with a, a big container a boat. Now we're shipping, you know, 35,000 boxes on some of the, those big ships. So that's what happened. Uh, that's what happened in the last 50 years, which uh, led to globalization. But we had uh, two major events that occurred recently. Of course, we had COVID, and then we had the war in Ukraine, which are events that can happen again. We And that has put a stop to this uh, logistics chain and to uh, for a number of companies, a number of companies wondered about it. 
What we need to know is during the COVID uh, crisis, we're talking about thousands of boats that were blocked around China or that were blocked in LA because the entry port to the US is LA. So 40% of the goods that enter the US started with Los Angeles. So the ship, ships were being blocked there. So how do you supply the plants? How do you supply the clients who need their goods? How does it, have, how does it work? So I'm not going to say that it put a stop, but it clearly raised a number of questions for companies. We support them. I'm an insurer, so of course I, I support them, I help them. Uh, and we're trying to see how we could do to uh, mitigate that. Second crisis, the crisis in Ukraine, uh, and both are linked because what happened with COVID, uh, we saw uh, certain companies that started moving from uh, sea to, to land, and I think you've already heard about the Silk Road. The Silk Road was originally made to uh, transport some goods throughout, uh, from China, throughout the whole European continent, and Russia, and eventually to Europe. Unfortunately, uh, the invasion of Ukraine uh, came around and the sanctions. So the other option to sea transport was blocked by those sanctions. So in two or three years, we accumulated a number of problems for transport, for global transport. And I think that we're um, moving towards eventually uh, the idea of manufacturing closer to the clients. So to start again to have our manufacturing plants close to uh, the clients. Second thing I wanted to raise uh, is the carbon footprint. Companies have more and more uh, this element to take into account. When I'm just going to give you an example of uh, the wood industry, which is uh, uh, quite symptomatic. Now we cut French wood and we ship it to China, and uh, we put it in a plant and we and we turn it into um, furniture and we ship them back to French clients back in France. It's just absolutely ridiculous. The f carbon footprint is 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 outrageous. In a few years, we went from 600 million tons, uh, of course, uh, 600 million tons of CO2 with just sea freight that are released in the atmosphere. Again, uh, companies have to take into account these factors and think uh, how they can do it different to mitigate this carbon footprint as much as possible. So. I know it's all not only for trade or logistics, but this is an angle, a practical angle, that makes a number of companies wonder on whether they can carry on like this for the years to come. So the flow of goods to the flow of capitals, now I'm turning to Ming Po Kai, because you're a founder, chairman of the, the investment fund, Caddy Capital, six billion assets. How did you see the evolution of these flows of capitals throughout the last years? Hello? Sunday morning is hard. Cate is a global platform, and we fully own this role, even in the, con the current context. We are rooted in France, it's created by a Chinese national, but it doesn't stop me from being very French. And we invest in the US, in China, and globally. We identify ourselves as a French slash European fund. Today, uh, despite everything that's going on, we believe uh, that a global platform can help companies to better build their trust and the trust between con continents. If we take uh, talk about trade, uh, one of the fundamental rules of, rules of tr trade is trade. It's not nations who do trade. It's not politicians who trade. It's uh, tradesmen. It's you have to be in business to do some trade. So if there are crises in the business world in the trade world. We don't find our common interest. You may be the smartest person in the world if you sign a contract and the contract is not fair. Somebody goes home and realizes that he's not going to do it. He's not going to honor the contract, so he's going to renegotiate, and that's part of trade. Let's focus 
on uh, the people who do trade, the, who do business. Let's not underestimate the role of business people, of entrepreneurs. A bus an entrepreneur, if he succeeds, it means that he will find a solution for a problem or to address a need. So he will always find a way to go as look as far as possible the people who need his product or service to turn it into a business. As an investor, we've invested in 300 companies, mostly in Europe, a lot, a bunch in, in the US and some in Asia, China and Southeast Asia. And I see that this need uh, to identify the needs is essential. But if the same entrepreneur is starting point is what do I want instead of what can I do for the other, it's not work. It's not working. So that comes back to the table is utility. What use does your client have with your product or service? And in trade, we have four verticals with six billions. You know, you can have fun and you can do a lot of first analysis. You see the vertical, you see the digital. The digital tools take you even further away in, in from an energy point of view, health a healthcare point of view, fintechs. And today, I could see that before you would do business and you would do make a profit. Today, if you don't, and that would be enough. Today, you have to wonder about the consequence that you created for your environment while you were doing the deal. For example, in industry, you have uh, industries uh, that have supply chains. They build big plants uh, and they export their CO2. So the consumer, Yesterday, Rodolphe Saté took the example of flying some Kiwis from New Zealand or from Australia to Europe. We don't realize, but you have to realize, in fact, where it comes from. And as an investor, we went to the core of the subject. What positive impact do I have to integrate in my business model? And it's just, just not a marketing phrase. It's uh, you're my neighbor, we do business together, so I'm going to make sure that in, fifth, in five, ten years you're proud to having been done business with me. And that is something that geopolitical people do ge deal with geopolitical forget. They have to bring back the human on the table because it is about a human relationship at the beginning. I, it's, it's not that I don't believe in a relationship between nations, but after 33 years uh, lived in France, uh, I'm from Orléans now in France, for those of you in the room who... Uh, and uh, France makes a bit better Chinese uh, of me, a man of me. I believe that the safest relationship is human relations. There's uh, 250 people, there's some uh, uh, Israeli, French, American, Indian, Chinese people, employees in the company. I cannot guarantee anything else, but I've always, rank, I've, I've always guaranteed by investors, 80% of the money comes from Europe, and the people at Cate are good people. What does that mean? Our starting point is not what I want, but what can I do for you? The relationship between partners is, uh, is you have three qualities, you know, that, and I, he, you, you do 90% of the job, I do 1%, 10%, but still, you know, it doesn't matter because we try to help each other. And value is defined over time. So I think trade is going to come back. So, uh, Saori Katada, I turn to you. You work uh, on a trade uh, relationship, particularly in the Pacifics. You ask an interesting uh, question. How do the ob goals of creation of trade of these groups, do they mitigate or accelerate the current uncertainty in world trade? C'est un grand honneur d'être ici. And that's the extent I can speak French, so I apologize, but I would like to speak in, in English. 
So um, now I would like to focus a, a bit on the nation state side coming from the, the business perspective. And when we were formulating this uh, panel, uh, the coordinator told us to think about this uh, incompatibility between the trade globalization and the fragmented politics, the political system. And this was uh, uh, the, from, the, the, uh, the, from the, the theories and the, the studies of Dr. Alain. And he actually, at that point in the 1980s, talked about the regionalism, use of regionalism integration and regionalism inst you know, institutions as one of the solutions to mitigate this incompatibility with the two, globalization and the political fragmentation. So in that context, I would like to make three points about how the regional uh, integration, regional kind of uh, arrangement at this point in the context of in the Indo-Pacific uh, is working or, or whether it's going to be a dangerous thing to moving forward. Before uh, talking about making three points, I would like to uh, make sure that you understand you know, that everybody's uh, in the same page in terms of how Indo-Pacific is quite important. Uh, about 60% of the global population and 60% of GDP, global GDP, reside in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, with two thirds of the trade uh, working on uh, working there, and 90% of the emerging middle class uh, from now to 2030, according to the EU calculation, uh, would reside in this uh, region of Indo-Pacific. So, first of all, this is the kind of how how we conceptualize regionalism and regional arrangement in the context of today compared to the 1980s. But which is the concept that Indo-Pacific is not really geographical in nature. And I think uh, the, uh, Dr. Uh, has, Jaconet has already kind of talked to us about that. It's a kind of arrangement that consists of the kind of like-minded like -minded countries, uh, governments, uh, which can be multilateralism, plurilateralism, you know, various uh, other arrangement, especially uh, of the free trade agreement like the RCEP and CPTPP, while this could be take other, other style like the Indo-Pacific uh, economic uh, framework that the US had advo uh, has uh, started to, uh, to promote since a couple of years ago. So this is the kind of, uh, this has a distinct membership, obviously who, in who to include, who to exclude is quite important, uh, but also it has a function to evolve over time so RCEP has a renegotiation kind of a, 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 a agreement within. Uh, obviously, CPTPP is expanding. UK is going to be the official member of it in a couple of weeks, I understand. Uh, and you, I think uh, Ukraine, Ukraine just uh, applied officially to join CPTPP. So in some ways, as I mentioned, it's not a geographical in nature and it's evolving over time. And one important thing about this is it's a rule, it's a rule setting and rule abiding kind of institution where the, the rule of the game for the businesses and for the government is being discussed, negotiated and agreed upon. The second point is then what, what the goal of this or how, you know, who is it serving? You know, in many ways, in the context of the Indo-Pacific, many of the emerging economies has had the tradition of pursuing growth. Economic growth is still a very, very important and a critical part of what they pursue, the government, businesses, people, and all alike. And in some ways, trade integration is a, a very important part on one side. At the same time, sovereign, co sovereign control, the government's control over the process of it has been quite an uh, essential part of this. Uh, for a long time, East Asia has had ambivalent feeling about neoliberalism, neoliberalism and the reforms imposed by the IMF, I'm sorry, but uh, other, other kind of uh, uh, advanced nations, and they want to have more control, but with the kind of integration and economic uh, uh, the trade involvement and the trade expansion in mind. In that context, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which just uh, which came into effect about a year ago with ASEAN 10 members, plus five countries, Japan, South Korea, China, as well as Australia and New Zealand. India just kind of uh, left the RCEP negotiation uh, just before it concluded. But anyway, RCEP is an important example where it's a very inclusive institution, even though it's a geographically defined, it covers uh, the supply chains, which are very important for the region, 
and uh, it takes ASEAN centrality, the small countries are being a central part of this. You know, even though it's been discussed as a China-centric arrangement, it is the ASEAN that actually drove this. So altogether, that type of arrangement, uh, being inclusive, being, uh, being uh, considerate of all the countries which has a very different level of de development is very important. And finally, the question, the third point question is, how about China? Where does China fit in? You know, obviously, when we count, Indo count all the GDP growth and all that in the Indo-Pacific, China is included in it, but how do we see it in terms of the geoeconomics of this region? Um, the rule-based order is quite very crucial for China, for the, for the world, and integration of China into this. It's been, we've been, we've been, or the world has been trying this for uh, quite, a, uh, quite, quite a few decades now, and it continues to be the case. Um, especially the kind of new arrangement like IPEF, this is the US-led uh, effort of uh, Indo-Pacific Economic, uh, Economic uh, Framework, is to make rules that uh, others will abide by and that should spread around the region. And also it's a way to um, mitigate the risk of over-dependence on China. So that in some ways it's uh, really crucial to incorporate and integrate, engage with China but in a way with, uh, based on a, a very uh, ex explicit rules. But at the same time, obviously, there is a, a emerging sense that China has to be kept in check. And, all, and the G7 meeting in Hiroshima just a few months ago has already discussed the fact that there'll be some kind of the collective security on the economic front is emerging, where uh, there'll be uh, a lot of effort on the part of G7 members as well as the like-minded countries to uh, work against uh, economic coercion being imposed on other countries uh, uh, by, by China's uh, economic, uh, economic um, might. So to summarize, uh, this is a regional bottom-up effort. Obviously, again, the region doesn't necessarily mean geographic. And in that sense, the European, uh, European, uh, European kind of uh, uh, engagement in this effort is really crucial. And I would like to stop here. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. After taking stock of all the situation and having talk about, talked about all these transformations, we are going to see how can we trust the world system? What is the role of international organizations within uh, this framework? Um, Mr. Shasuke, you have the floor. Yes, I would like to react as to some of the observations made by the other panelists, I found them very interesting, especially a first point on the uh, climate stakes, how are they uh, threatened by the fragmentation risk of a world trade. And what I found interesting that was pointed out by Benoit, we are seeing a reshoring trend with a direct effect. It will reduce CO2 emissions related to production chains that were very extended with raw materials or intermediary goods crossing the ocean several times. So there's a, a silver lining in this. But there's also a danger, an important danger at two levels. First of all, in this new cycle, which we're entering, we are seeing a re-emergence of the role of industrial politicians. They have their place for strategic strategy, for strategic safety uh, when facing economic threats that a, a country can uh, face. But they also have their place in the uh, against the backdrop of energy transition where a country needs to commit investments and large infrastructure investments and to define international and national uh, strategies. This re-emergence of industrial politicians is combined with a uh, re-emergence of form of protectionism to the detriment of uh, uh, trade of exchanges, when we talk about uh, added exchanges, we see that there's uh, less of it now, and that will be a uh, problem. Also, the production of renewable energies, that's another subject. So to reach our decarbonation objectives uh, 
for which we uh, made commitments within the Paris Agreement. That requires a lot of investment efforts in windmills, in solar panels, in fuel cells, and that requires from us to have access to minerals and raw m materials whose access is very unequal. The in inter International Agency of Energy says we have enough raw materials to uh, go through this uh, transition, this energy transition. However, it's not a uniformed access, and we need to favor commercial exchanges. And if we were to have restrictions on raw materials, then we might not make it or it might take too much time. So there's a real debate at stake here. I would like to follow up on the role of international organizations as well. The role of international organization, we talk about macroeconomic, financial crisis, and so on with the IMF, but the essential body is the World Trade Organization, obviously. It is an organization which hasn't worked properly for some years. It has had a, encountered a certain number of problems created by the member states themselves because they want to circumvent the world trade rules and do something else. And this is a real subject. We have a system based on rules of conduct. With, when we talk about world trade, there are rules to abide by and warnings and reprimands if we do not abide by them. So when we talk about regional agreements, what would happen if one country does not respect the rules? There should be some systems set up. And this is why we talk about the rules of the game, the rules-based institutions. And at the World Bank, at the IMF, and the WTA, WTO, how do we think about this? We have to understand that we're entering a new cycle. So we should not uh, carry on with the previous trajectory. We've had some defaults, some imperfections that were outlined previously. So we should have a pragmatic approach. There are subjects, stakes, issues that are very important. The climate change transition is important. The problem of the debt as well. And over indebtedness for a lot of emerging countries that cannot face uh, their repayment deadlines is important as well. For the global world, this is important. For all the authorities, we need to work together, to carry on working together, to enter into agreements and to move forward, even if on some other subject it's more difficult to do so. What we hope is that gradually, progressively, we will be able to rebuild or to grow trust the trust that could exist in the past, and sometimes it is lacking uh, amongst governments. It requires time. And this is a bit uh, what was mentioned earlier. We need to meet with them. We need to have conversations with them, discussions, and a willingness to move forward together, hand in hand, in the right direction. And then something, last but not least, something that is really important, we talked about the notions of French shoring or reshoring. It is important to take into consideration what we need to do. We need to have a more robust system when we are facing shocks, especially for value chains, when we've had value chain crisis as we've had with the pandemic. We need to be more robust, but that doesn't mean that we should reshore production in, uh, domestically. The economic system makes it is more robust, but it's very much dependent on the domestic shocks. So the future is in diversification. That's the basic principle of financial theories. We need to have a portfolio of assets that is diversified, and we cannot have all the eggs in the same basket, basically. We should have, this is what we see with multinational companies progressively, they adopt this logic and they diversify their supply chains. That doesn't mean that they bring everything back home necessarily. Do you wish to react to uh, the solutions for the future? How can we instill trust in the world system? The world system, uh, uh, 
we've talked about WTO as being undergoing an important crisis. But the world system doesn't work either. The Council of Security is at a standstill with the war in Ukraine. So we will need to rebuild this world. And to do so, we'll have to set up a multipolar system. We've talked about the rivalry between China and the US, but we also need to have a global south to be taken into consideration. In all continents, it needs to be taken into consideration. They don't want to be aligned with such and such country. Most of these are a, part, a member of the G20, and that's the international body that still exists. And certainly, we'll have to discuss about the reform of the Council of Security for these countries to uh, have uh, their voice heard. We need to have discussions. We need to have contacts. We've talked about trade, but what about tourism as well? It's very important to uh, keep uh, getting to know one another and not ignoring what an, one another, as was done during the health crisis in China. This is also related to perception, to understanding. It's not really a matter of reality. It's how we perceive things. Yves -Olivier, Pierre Olivier said it very well. When I was 12 years old, I saw things in a way. Now that I'm an adult, I see things differently. And I would like to say that when from here, we look at China from a certain angle. We watch TV, TF1. It seems that our perception is, is, is very misleading because we see it through the prism of our TV. But China is changing, is changing towards a new economy, to a, an energy transition, to decarbonization. And this is very burdensome. We have to continue traveling, as Sylvie has said earlier. We need to understand that one's perception may not be the reality. When uh, we want to understand France, we need to learn French. When we uh, look at China, it's important to understand the Chinese culture. Do you have a few words to say? Well, we were talking about hope. I'm working with an American group that is present in 54 countries in the world. And very recently, they took a majority stake in an insurance company in China. So we do have hope. It continues. We have to say to people, we have to discuss with others, we have to open up. So yes, I'm very positive, I'm very optimistic. So on this positive note, I would like to thank you all. Thank you to all our participants, uh, uh, to Sylvie Berman, Minko Pai. Sylvie Berman will have an autograph session at the FNAC stand on her book, Ambassador of France to, Pe to Beijing. And Pierre Jacquet, you have the last words. Thank you. What I, uh, my takeaway message from this session is three things. Miko said, trade is a matter of traders, yes. But the framework in which they're working is defined by politicians. And as Pierre Olivier said, we need to have rules of the game, especially in commercial matters. They're still very weak and we need to toughen them up and we reinforce them with the WTO, not as was done in France as a vector of free trade, but rather as a, uh, save, uh, as a guardian of values. And this is how we can carry on with negotiations and over the long term. Trade, smooth trade is an illusion, yes. 
And Pierre Olivier said that trade could uh, allow uh, countries to unify their values. It's not the case. So we have to live in a world where the Western values of proselytisms of values won't exist. And what we have to apply is what Europeans did in their own region, is mutual recognition, namely a, a layer of common values, basic values, human rights, environmental rights, for instance. But beyond this, there is diversity, and we have to accept this diversity. And this is important. It has a political and social facet that is very worthwhile. And I do believe in this diversified world. This would uh, le lead us to a reason globaliz globalization. And this complexity is very important for us. We've talked about the costs of trade and logistics, and that's very important. And when we talk about commercial trade, we often forget about logistics. We think that they are insignificant and constant, but logistics is one of the living um, facets of trade, and we should highlight that, and it was important to do so. And then when we talk about interdependence, it is a reality. It means that autonomy is an illusion, sovereignty, full sovereignty is an illusion. Being autonomous and working on national security is, is being capable of managing dependence in an open world, and that has a political dimension and a social part dimension as well that is quite important. And trade should be consistent with national objectives. This is why I go back to what we said earlier. We have a role in terms of domestic policy. Trade is also a mechanism whereby environmental uh, objectives can be reached via domestic policy. It's important to have uh, world trade to install a collective uh, cooperation with a common denominator. Thank you.
morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted to see you again for this uh, Sunday morning session. It's not too hot yet. I am Cécile Desjardins. I am editor-in-chief at the magazine L'Opinion, and we're going to talk this morning about Europe, the main challenges of the European Union, and we'll see that there are many of them. I would like to introduce your speakers. Uh, we have a beautiful panel this morning. Uh, Katrine Luboshansky, who's the coordinator of the session. She's a professor at the Paris University and member of the Cercle des Economistes. Next to you, Catherine, uh, there is Pierre Lévy, who's a French ambassador to Russia since the tw beginning of 2021. So we'll say that he's the heart at the geopolitical uh, issues. Next to him, Thiago Antunes, Secretary of State for European Affairs for the Prime Minister of Portugal. Pierre-André de Chalandard, you are CEO of Saint-Gobain. For those of you uh, who don't know, it's a major, huge group uh, specialized in building materials, uh, present in many countries. Uh, Adam Tous, your professor at the University of Columbia for the European Institute. And next to you, Marja Krusma, Chief Scientific Advisor with the European Commission. Welcome to all of you. Catherine, uh, I will leave you the difficult role to set the debate. I said that there are many challenges. Why is this roundtable so important this morning? It is important because, as you probably noticed, uh, the first uh, inaug inaugural uh, session of Friday on how to renew hope the European Union was at the forefront of that session already. So I think that if we want to renew hope, we need to uh, watch what the European Union has done for many years, for a few years, we can renew hope. And we see that with not so much with the emergence of concepts that are really um, important at the moment with sovereignty and strategic importance. There are concepts that are difficult to, to explain and de define, but these concepts uh, matter because they cannot be applicable to European countries taken individually. You, a country, an individual European country, even among the biggest one, weighs less economically than some multinational companies. So they don't stand their chance by themselves. And you see how union can bring strength. So starting um, with this idea of that the sovereignty or strategic autonomy can only be constructed at the European level, we understand that the member states of the European Union have to give up on some of their sovereignty. And that is very tricky. However, it happened. We see that uh, we can have hope. And particularly because of the crisis that shook Europe and the world. And because of those crises, we could see that Europe has had to uh, intervene in some fields that before would be uh, the, the prerogative in, the, among the individual prerogatives of the countries. We can also see how Europe was creative with the, after the Ukraine war, we saw that the Europe of defense is making progress and also to overcome the neutrality of some countries that are member of the Union, Europe has created the European facility for peace. So we can see uh, how Europe uh, manages to combine uh, all these uh, different opinions, these cultural differences between countries. So this topic is also uh, of the union as a strength, is a fundamental one because uh, it is part of a very uh, brutal confrontation between three major political, geopolitical blocks. Uh, which are, of course, the United States, Europe, and then uh, China or the BRICS, uh, depending on how we uh, think. And we can see that it's a fairly brutal confrontation. China is restricting uh, the access to metals that are important for decarbonization. How do we do? Because you know we don't produce a lot of these rare metals. It is a fundamental topic because it is also part of a new political environment with the rise of populism within European countries. 
And because we're talking about enlarging the European Union, if we accept more countries with even more differences, uh, cultural differences, is this enlargement not going to be a factor of, uh, not an additional factor of disagreement within the Union? There are many questions that we can ask and raise. I had prepared way too many. Um, some questions uh, are about the political, uh, the energy policy. We can see that the Union managed to secure the energy supply uh, following the war in Ukraine. So the, Un the European Union did a great job on that uh, front, but we cannot agree on the, term the, the fixing of the price of electricity, which is fundamental because each country has its own peculiarities with uh, its energy production. The last point maybe that I would like to raise is, can we hope that the EU become more uh, proactive than reactive. That would be the little uh, glimpse of hope that I would like to uh, to add to the, the debate. We should, uh, we could see that the EU has completely changed its way of reasoning uh, towards the, the competition laws and many other things. But can it not become a bit more proactive rather than progressing, uh, advancing only when hit by a crisis. Thank you very much, Catherine. You put, you asked a lot of questions. I don't know if we'll be able to take them all, but it surely gives us a good way to start. And uh, to, I'd like to go around the table, and I would start uh, from the basis of our title, the title of this round table, Europe, strength, uh, union as a strength. There's no question mark at the end of the title. Maybe we should put one. Or at least I'm asking it to you as a question, in the form of a question. Do you, today, is Europe a strength? Pierre Lévy, of course, I'd like to start with you because you really are the heart of the geopolitical uh, challenges uh, from Moscow. So what, do you, what is your take on that? First of all, thank you for uh, having invited me. Uh, I think uh, there's a great spirit uh, in these uh, meetings at X uh, under this theme of uh, renewing hope, and I would not like to spoil uh, this uh, spirit of hope. And the organizers took a major risk by inviting me, so I'm, I'm thanking them for them. I'm, this was a joke. Uh, more seriously, I'd like to make a first uh, remark. I'd like to. Uh, analyze the situation of Europe and the challenges that it's facing, looking it through the angle of the Ukraine war. We need to remember that it's on 24th February 2022. For me, it's a telluric date, like 1945, you know, or 1991. So this is a the war that, it's a crisis that will last for a long time. It's a war in Europe, but with the effect that go way beyond Europe. In the management of this confrontation, as you said, your union is a strength. It is even the first imperative. There, We had many surprises since the beginning of this uh, special operation, to use the, the, the official title used by Russia. The first surprise is that Europe has shown a lot of unity. As of March 2022, there's been a European Council that uh, f identified, uh, under the French uh, presidency, uh, identified the policy to support Ukraine. There are about maybe 90 billion euros uh, of help uh, for Ukraine. There's some sanctions that have been taken uh, unanimously. So a lot has been done. And I would say that this unity is even more remarkable because the relationship to Russia has been for a while one of the most polarizing topics in in Europe for all the reasons, the geopolitical uh, story, uh, his, uh, reasons that we know. I was in Prague, I was in Warsaw, I can measure uh, the meaning that Russia has from Tallinn or from Lisbon. And that's what makes one of the vulnerabilities of Europe, but also one of its strengths. And I think among the debate, we'll have a chance to, dis to discuss this further. So we have managed since uh, 2014 to go over those differences. Mm -hmm. 
there's an um, important point for the debate uh, distance that with that we have uh, that the U.S. have with the Russia, whereas the Europeans are uh, are really uh, very close at the doorstep of Russia. So that makes a difference in the relationship. So when we watch of what's going on, it's very comforting to see that we have managed to overcome our differences, or at least put them aside for a while. Tiago Antunes, uh, Tiago Antunes, you are uh, between Brussels and Portugal. How do you see how this European Union uh, f to f being being uh, brought together to, to face the crisis? Well, if we look uh, into backwards, uh, into the recent years, and this, uh, we're almost reaching the end of uh, the European electoral term, and throughout this uh, European mandate, indeed, we have seen a lot of unity, uh, and unity in face of difficult challenges. Um, Europe has done things extraordinary. Um, reacting to COVID with the joint acquisition of vaccines, something that was not foreseen um, and was um, not in the treaties, but it was uh, Europe, it was what Europe, what Europe, the Europeans needed. So the European Commission went ahead and, 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 and with this joint acquisition the vaccines. And then in dealing with the economic consequences of, of the pandemic, we created a, 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 an array of new instruments, COVID, which managed to keep our labor force. Um, sure, uh, sorry, sure instrument, which managed to keep our labor force. Next generation EU, uh, which has a volume of uh, uh, money to support uh, the, the impacts of COVID, which was uh, really very significant. And that on the basis of a common borrowing, something that was deemed absolutely forbidden. Uh, so we overcame a lot of taboos uh, in order to respond to uh, the pandemic. And then with the war, we also have shown a great deal of unity. We have already adopted 11 packages of sanctions unanimously. Uh, the support to Ukraine is um, political, financial, military support uh, is there uh, throughout Europe. We were all afraid that at some point that might be some war fatigue and fatigue of the consequences of the war. But the fact is that both in our societies and in our governments, uh, there is unanimous support for Ukraine. Uh, we have managed to do a lot in terms of diversifying our energy sources and our access to energy and moving away, diversifying away from Russian fossil fuels in a very short period of time. So we have done uh, things which are really uh, formidable, and we have shown a great deal of unity. So, um, drawing from the lessons of these recent years, uh, I think it's uh, correct that there's no question mark. Indeed, union is a strength, and the European Union has shown these strengths, and it has acted uh, in a united fashion uh, to face unforeseen crisis and uh, so and this is what Europe is all about is about facing crisis and facing them uh, together and really we have had some um, significant examples of that Pierre -André de Chalandard, qu pense les, les Pierre -André de Chalandard, what do companies think about it uh, is the union helping companies so on an economic front, it depends on the topics. For on the climate front, uh, I believe that clearly uh, Europe has shown its unity and it's a strength. The Fit for 55 uh, package makes Europe the place in the world where we are the most advanced, we are leaders. Of course, there are a few disagreements here and there between countries. There's some disagreements among the member states, but these packages that were adopted have given uh, a lot of, have very, uh, provide a lot of strengths. And I think that the European Union speaks with one voice. It is quite uh, obvious, and that brings us strengths. Let's not forget that uh, sometimes we have a tendency to forget that uh, Europe is ahead. It's seven percent of uh, the worldwide emissions, so we're not capable to embark uh, all the other countries with us. And I think that we need to 
we don't need to be constantly feeling guilty because we are really ahead on that. If we take another important na notion today, which is the notion of industrial uh, power, are we united as an industrial power? This is much less uh, obvious. This is work in progress, as I would say in English. The historic vision of the Commission is uh, focused on competition and on the interest of uh, the consumers. So it kind of contradicts the idea of an industrial power. And this vision still um, influences the way we see things in the European Union. We have a big market. We have one of the biggest markets in the world. Uh, we're not completely unified on the capital markets. But the notion, the historic notion of Brussels uh, on competition laws, it doesn't go with the idea of industrial power. I think there's been some changes, the tribal crisis, uh, the health crisis, the energy crisis, and the Ukraine crisis, and the rise of the rivalry between Russia and the United States has clearly, uh, have clearly helped things uh, to get to, to change. The notion of uh, industrial policy doesn't sound like a bad word anymore. So we have made progress on that front. And it is a good thing, even if uh, Bruno Le Maire uh, said that we're going to break the taboos. But from my point of view, it is still work in progress. Catherine, if you want to react. Yes, I had a, a small question on on reindustrialization, we know that it is fundamental. We have the impression that countries um, deal with that in a scattered way, individually, because we're being announced proudly at the summit uh, that uh, foreign capitals in France have increased, that foreign investments have increased, all is well. But when we dwell into this, it's at the detriment of uh, Germany or other European countries. So is it a victory? Well, when you reason with a traditional vision of Brussels, which is to organize a big market, uh, you know, countries inside Europe are competing against one another. The reality is that with the US and the geopolitical change, we have to change things. It's not totally the case. But you've talked about energy policy. We've made some progress, but we're not there yet. You're British. You've been talking for the US. Uh, can you give us a few words on uh, European finance? This has, was mentioned by Pierre-André this morning. Uh, also expressing my gratitude for the invitation to be here. And um, to reassure you also that though I am indeed born in Britain and live and work in the US, I, I grew up in Germany, so I'm a broken-hearted European oh, 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 with a wrong that. passport. Um, and I want to emphasize that in particular because I want to put the question mark back. I think we have to put the question mark back for four reasons, really, very, very briefly. First, that though I agree with the minister, Europe in the last three years has succeeded in not failing. It was expected to fail with good reason. And since the high point of collaboration around vaccines and next-gen EU, the curve has been downwards towards greater dissension and greater difficulty in agreement. And that's point number one. Point number two is that Europe remains overshadowed by the legacies of the Eurozone crisis where the constraining framework of European finance was not a strength, but essentially a means of slowly strangulating growth in Southern Europe and the youth, the young people of Spain, Italy, and indeed of France as well, of Portugal, have a story to tell about that. So there is a declining ability to act now. There is a bad history from the, purpose, from the point of view of somebody interested in ever closer union. Thirdly, I think the question mark can also be there in the sense of why is Europe not closer to its potential? Because if it's true that Europe is only responsible for 7% of CO2 emissions, Europe could be the rival to the dollar as the only viable other reserve currency, and it is not 
because it chooses not to be, because it chooses only to issue a very limited amount of joint debt. And that's the fourth reason, I think, why we need to put a question mark at the end, which is that ultimately, though we're here in a meeting of economists, it's perfectly obvious that these choices are political. Political both in the macroscopic sense of whether or not you have a vision, but all the way down to the level of the composition of the German coalition government in the current moment and the way in which Finance Minister Lindner chooses to position himself or not position himself on the European fiscal rules for entirely local political reasons. And that's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what democracy actually consists of. But if Europe prides itself in being a democracy, there's always going to be a question mark there. And the job and the work of convincing Europeans to act together and be strong together has to be done over and over and over again. And that's why that question mark is healthy, I think. It's not a bad thing that it's there. This is not a matter of structural economic determination. This is something about a community choosing to act together. And right now I have to say, I don't know how optimistic I am about that. Uh, Marsha Kosma, you are a specialist of You are a specialist of scientific subjects and crisis management with this uh, double prism. What is your analysis? Also, from, for inviting me here, uh, a scientist looks at crisis as um, looking at common features, which is good because Although all the crises are different from each other, there is still something in common so we can learn. And we could actually see how in the last decades Europe been actually stumbling from one crisis to another, but you know, kind of still standing on its foot and learning its lessons and going on. And somehow the crises are also different from each other. I think where we are in a different place from Corona crisis is, as already Pierre was mentioning, is much more polarizing. Why? Because it's much more value-based than Corona crisis. Why? Because, for example, Corona virus didn't say to us that I'm going to declare war to this degenerate Nazis in the West who cannot get their act together anyway, right? And nobody thought that, oh, maybe we should go and negotiate with the Conora Viners. Maybe it becomes better if we talk to it, or maybe it's still okay to do some trade with the Corona Viners. And if it keeps the yachts in our harbors and money in our banks, so why not? So you could see that we are more tested at this moment to have a clear stand where the European solidarity is. And if we come to the next lurking crisis of climate change, it's again a little bit different. The bad news is that it is not going to disappear tomorrow, even if we start act today. There's so much heat already captured in the oceans of the planet that just absorbs this, or just to release this heat takes 30 years, even if we stop uh, emitting any greenhouse gases today. So we're going to live a very long time with the consequences with it. And I would still also, as Adam keeps a question mark, exactly for that reason. Every crisis is a little bit different, and it all depends on whether we are capable of learning lessons from the previous one and applying it to the next one, which we might even not know is what is this going to be. So, if we sum up, I would like to each of you, what is your specialty, your specific expertise? What is the biggest challenge according to you? The time is broken, so we're fine with uh, being uh, ahead of time or lagging behind. We don't care anymore. It's up to you first. So the biggest challenge, for, as far as I'm concerned, for Europe is to reconcile the economic uh, challenges with competitiveness. We are doing well on the climate uh, change front, but in terms of competition, we've been uh, suffering from the war in Ukraine and the energy supply chain front, 
and we are the only area in the world where we continue to uh, uh, to vouch for free trade. So indeed, it's very efficient. When we forget economic theories, it's also good to fight against inflation. But free trade only works if we are not the only ones to want free trade. And this is no longer the case. So, what kind of problem do we face in Europe? We have uh, our commitments in terms of fighting against climate change, and we do, it, we do so with taxes and regulations. Normally, we should wrap it up with some free trade in our economic theory that should be the carbon tax, and I was part of those that were very much in favor on paper. Uh, for a carbon tax, but when we implemented it with the the carbon, the border, the transborder carbon adjustment regulation, we had something that was inoperative, and that led to the uh, relinquishment of huge segments of European industry. The the car industry is uh, the embodiment of this. This was driven by climate, and we had a huge tsunami of Chinese cars right now. The Americans, they reconcile uh, climate and uh, competitiveness with the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that is supported also by the WTO. And uh, the President Biden uh, said it clearly yesterday. And then the, the others benef interpret the WTO rules in their own way in China. So we have to reconcile both. Pierre Olivier, what is the greatest challenge? With the mic, it's better. Well, first, I would like to say that unity is the light motive of our discussion. It's constantly tested out with our political choices. It's not a slogan that we should repeat and repeat on, on, on one's uh, seat on and on and on again. I think that unity should be facing a combination of challenges, and I see four of them. First of all, we should resist the war and doing everything we can to restore European uh, peace and stability in the world. Secondly, it should not be polarized, geographically speaking, first but should not focus only on the challenges eastwards. We also have challenges in Africa, in Asia, in Pacific region. And it should not be uh, polarized them thematically speaking with the digital transformation, the energy and industrial policies. Thirdly, we have the challenge of the transatlantic relationship we have to reinforce it, preserve it, and the EU must make sure, first of all, that its interests are safeguarded, and sometimes to the detriment of the US because they might not be aligned. And then we have to preserve, keep, and build uh, the operational capacity of the EU. That means we have to deliver. We are touching upon the stakes that you mentioned earlier on the industrial base, competitiveness of the EU, this, of course, is indissociable from the rest. And above all, let's not forget this. This debate is not without political uh, colors. There are choices that need to be made from a political point of view with elections in tw 27 state members that match a vote budget, ratified accession treaties. And so we need to be careful about that. Uh, let's not forget the US elections in November 2024 as well. The biggest challenge, for as far as I'm concerned, is therefore that the EU must be resilient and safe when facing this tsunami in Europe and beyond, because this is uh, the condition for everything else. 
what about the challenge? Is it political in your opinion? A while ago, I was talking about the recent years, looking to the past. Now, looking to the future, we do have huge challenges ahead. The biggest one is to maintain our unity in the European Union uh, in facing these uh, problems and in finding uh, common solutions to these problems. Because, as Adam was saying, in a less optimistic tone than I used, um, it's true that unity is not always there. It has not always been there. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, you're right, I come from Portugal. I know um, how flawed the European response to the uh, financial crisis of 2008 was. And so we've not always uh, succeeded in finding the right answers and in being uh, united. But over the recent years, as I said, we have shown a great deal of unity in facing with insurmountable crisis. And I hope that we'll keep this unity in facing the challenges ahead. In the short term, we need to be able to agree on the reform of um, economic governance framework in Europe. It will be uh, very difficult. There are very, the positions are um, not close. Uh, but we'll need to find this agreement until the end of the year before the general escape clause expires because it doesn't make sense to go back to the old fiscal rules. We cannot allow ourselves to go back to the old fiscal rules, so we need to find a difficult agreement on that. Also on the electricity market, on the reform of the electricity market, on trade deals, because it is important that we do a lot of trade in the single market, but we also need to be open to um, other areas of the the world outside of Europe for commercial reasons, but also for geopolitical reasons, particularly Latin America. We'll have an important summit with Latin America uh, next week, and it's important to finalize also trade deals with um, Chile, Mexico, Mercosul, uh, in order to be able to have, uh, uh, that Europe maintains an important role in these areas of the, of the planet. And then I would say, looking into the longer term, the biggest challenge, for sure, is the enlargement. Uh, and in um, finding the solutions to be able to uh, get new members on board of the European Union. Because this uh, enlargement brings in numerous challenges to European policies, such as agri common agricultural policy, cohesion policy. It will be a huge, it will have a huge impact on our budget. Uh, and it will have a huge impact in how, in the European governance, in institutional issues, and how we function. Because it's totally different to work with 27 around the table, or to work with potentially 36, or 5 or 36 at the table. So our current set of rules, the way we make decisions, our decision-making rules, they are not uh, ready, they are not uh, enlargement proof. We need to reform before we enlarge. These are very difficult issues that will need to be solved unanimously, and we need to find a solution in order to be ready, to be prepared, to have the absorption capacity to accept new members. Enlargement is key. We need to go ahead with not only for the Western Balkans, also for Ukraine, Moldova, um, in the East, but we need to do how um, the candidate countries, they have a lot of homework to do before they can join. But we also, in the European Union, have a big homework in changing the way we are organized, changing our policies, our budget, in order to be uh, ready and fit for uh, working at 30-something. So this would be the biggest challenge ahead. Mar you can applaud him if you wish. Marcia, you have a question. you mentioned crisis management and the fact that Europe was uh, uh, permanently in uh, in a stage of crisis management. So, is the challenge ahead the, the challenge of governance? Yes, I think the challenge that Europe is going to have is how such a rather loose union, which um, European Union is, uh, meaning that respecting its subsidiarity principle, which basically means that every member state minds its own business until it's not capable of doing so anymore, and a high degree of independence and autonomy can rapidly, in unison, uh, uh, reply, react, 
to transboundary crisis. And we can see it's not going well all the time. Remember the first months of corona pandemics where every country had their own measures, hoarding the supplies for ourselves. And even we realized that countries do not have the same methods for calculating the mortality rates. So we actually have no good understanding what doesn't work or what works. Now these problems have been solved already and, um, and we're getting better. But my, uh, my feeling is that all this uh, European jargon of uh, coordination and harmonization and synchronization is not just a Brussels bureaucratic fluff but it's hardcore, no-nonsense government governance. And we have to invent new formats of making rapid decisions very fast, rapidly deploy financial instruments if something again will hit the fan. And my hope again is that we are learning to do it from one crisis to another. It's now up to you. You have a daunting task ahead of you talking about the challenges. Great points my fellow panelists have made. I, I can't help wondering whether this isn't a trick question in the sense that if there's one thing we've known over the, we've realized over the last 20 years is that we probably can't predict what the next big crisis is going to be. And if we can say anything in general about it, it's probably that it's not going to be one shock, but a whole series of shocks impacting us simultaneously in interconnected ways. If you think about the way in which COVID spilled over into inflation, and then Putin started a war. Uh, and that configuration is one which a key figure in recent European politics, Jean-Claude Juncker, actually gave a name to which is what he called polycrise or polycrisis, which was a phrase developed by French complexity theorist Edgar Morin. And I think in a sense, it's the dawning realization that that's the future, which then puts a premium on all of these other issues, the, the ability to rapidly respond to complex new events, the need for unity, what sits behind that is some very heavy duty politics about how you agree and allocate resources, but also tough governance. But I would insist, again, I'm sorry to be boring about this, but the organization of finance and money is fundamental, not because we should obsess about money and finance per se, and not because technology doesn't ultimately decide whether we live and die in a much more direct way. But the thing about money is that it's fungible. You can literally use it to do practically anything, from funding new research, to funding industrial policy, to dealing with debt crises, to assisting the Ukrainians, it's the one that's what it does, right? It is the general, uh, the means through which in modern economies we create a general value. And that's why postponing that issue and, and making it into this fetish in the way that certain sorts of visions of the EU have is profoundly disabling in the face of this kind of very unpredictable and very interconnected reality. Hello. Oh, oh, oh. We're getting close to the end. I would like uh, for each of you to tell us something that will renew hope. This is the title of our three days uh, meetings. Is there anything in the union that we can uh, find uh, hope in? Pierre Lévy, I want not to give you the floor, but still I want to give you the floor. On the geopolitical side, is there anything that is positive? Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil the party, uh, the intellectual party uh, of these uh, rencontres Renex. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, the European Union has the keys to the problem. Uh, I would like to give you a quick reminder, historic reminder. You have to remember that the European question was the trigger of the crisis because in 2013, 2012, there was this issue of signing of the agreement association, association uh, agreement uh, of, uh, with the European uh, Union with uh, Ukraine. 
and the president of Ukraine of the time, under the pressure of uh, Moscow, refused to sign this agreement in November 2013. And then we know how it all evolves. Uh, the Russians were already thinking along the lines of, uh, of influencing uh, the other countries. And that was a trigger moment when I say that Europe has the solutions. It is the European uh, aspirations to f of Ukraine and to others. And I will really speak from my experience. If you look at uh, the U Ukraine's looked at with envy how Poland uh, grew, and Russians will watch with envy how Ukraine will develop and will grow within the Union, uh, no matter what shape it takes. It is very important uh, that Ukraine and Russia have uh, similar uh, features, particularly uh, political, uh, politically speaking. And two other points, uh, the enlargement policy, I believe that it can be done successfully because there's always been this debate between, it is a foreign uh, policy tool, we need to bring stability, and those who say that it's an identity uh, instrument to absorb other countries. We've done it with the greatest uh, enlargement um, in uh, 1996, 2004, but some major issues are going to come around. And that will be my last message. There's a recipe for disaster, which is uh, to put on the table right away the treaty reform question, because some people will say it's impossible, it cannot be done, to have a commission with 35 members, we need to change the rules of voting, we need the different majority. This is recipe for disaster. We can do a lot of things uh, by using uh, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, there are many provisions inside of this treaty that will improve the functioning of the Union. And I believe it's a very important message to keep in mind. Um, not coming from a politician. Tiago, uh, very quickly, uh, maybe would you like to give an answer to that and a reason for hope? I think we should not focus on treaty change because that's a recipe for disaster, but we need reform and we need to find ways to reform and to be able to work uh, with more members inside the European Union. On um, well, we've talked a lot about crisis, several crises, poly crisis, um, and how the European Union has responded to those crises. And in all that, we have been faithful to the saying of one of our founding fathers, Jean Monnet, who said that the European Union will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions uh, for each of those crises. So that's what we've been doing. So my message, message of hope is that we will not waste the next crisis. It will come for sure. And we will use it in order to uh, get a, a, a move into a stronger, more united European Union, like we've done, not always, but in the recent years. And so I hope that we'll continue to go from crisis to crisis, finding solutions to what European citizens need, um, and advancing the European project and moving and evolving from crisis to crisis. And, uh, but by the way, since the crises keep coming, and we already know that, maybe we should have a permanent stabilization mechanism to deal with crises, so that we don't have to start from scratch, from the beginning, each time a crisis arises, so that maybe we have an instrument that we can activate whenever there is an economic crisis, but it's already there, and we don't have to waste time on difficult and uh, negotiations that drag on for days to find new solutions this time around. Adam, Adam, what is your reason for hope, or the, the European project that would give us reason for hope? Just following on from what was just said, the, the single most inspiring thing about Europe is it's still here. Um, it's still here and it's so good. Um, I mean, this may be a banal point to make, but it is very important, I think, that Europeans realize what an extraordinary privilege it is to have a EU, an EU passport. And there are literally millions of people on Europe's borders risking their lives every day, hoping to access not just the benefits and the privileges of life here, but also the forms of active citizenship and engagement that life in the EU makes possible. 
I travel like all over the United States. There is, I do not think, a single community in the United States which offers the kind of quality of life that just this one town in France offers its citizens. And you could replicate this across Eastern and Western and Northern and Southern Europe. Europe remains an incredible laboratory in the improvement of the human condition and of the way in which societies can live together, prioritizing a wide range of concerns, including welfare. There is no counterpart to the European welfare state anywhere else on the planet, full stop. And preserving that and developing that is, should be the central objective of the EU. Pierre-André, Pierre -André, the economic point of view. I'm going to rephrase what was said before. If Europe moves uh, forward because of the crisis, well, we're surely going to make progress. This is a reason for hope. On an economical point of view, the challenge that I showed, I have four uh, ways, uh, four avenues. We need to do what Americans tell us to do with the, IR, the IRA. Either we get into more debt than they do, but we don't have dollars, so we need to protect ourselves. Second thing, we need more innovation in Europe. We're lagging behind. We need to go back on innovation. Third pillar, it's a topic that we didn't discuss yet, but it solves a lot of other uh, subjects. We need more subsidiarity, the energy mix, uh, uh, more complementarity. It, it, is, it applies to any major organization. It is the case as well in France and in Europe. And also we need to uh, try to have a better narrative on the decarbonization, decarbonization to valorize uh, with everyone what Europe is doing and uh, to have a story that is more positive. I think uh, with all that, uh, that brings a lot of factors for optimism. Marsha. Uh, I like uh, your uh, reason for hope, so I'm not leaving you last for, uh, and it's for a reason that I let you speak last. Reasons for hope. First of all, that crises are always value-based, and they always um, make us think about why are we here, and what are we fighting for, and what do we have in common. So if there's something good with this horrible war, then it is that a common enemy is something that is a uniting factor. And I hope building, rebuilding Ukraine will be the same common goal for the Euro, uh, Euro, whole Europe, such as, uh, as fighting the climate change, crime mitigation, and other things. And another reason for hope is I actually can see European Union learning from one crisis to another. If you said about crisis, we had to have a permanent response for crisis management. We actually have it already in terms of European civil protection mechanism, which was activated 106 times last year. I just give you one example. When the corona pandemic started, it took months and months because we, before we can share some medical supply, uh, supplies and everything. But now when the Kahovka Dam disaster happened, so all the supplies were sent uh, on, on its way already, if not in hours, then within 24 hours at least. And this is, this is a very steep learning curve. So I think that Europe is a process. As, as Adam said, as long as we are still here, we have hope. I think uh, we don't have time for questions. Maybe I can take one question. The gentleman uh, was the first one to raise his hand. We're going to take uh, the mic. We're going to wait for you to take the mic. I uh, found uh, extremely interesting uh, the speeches of the panelists, but two things I'd like to point out in the construction of this new united Europe and this new generation of cooperation with the rest of the world. Let's move to the question. The first question 
a thing that was lacking in all your speeches, the real challenge of Europe is what model of society do we want to build for the major European nations? What development model do we want to build? And that's what will allow us to manage to transition successfully, whether it's energy transition or any other transition. So today, more than ever, Europe must be the model of this necessity to produce differently, to consume differently, to exchange differently, and to cooperate differently. Thank you, thank you. We just wanted one question. So, does some of you want to answer on that question on the model? Catherine, no, yes and no. Pierre-André uh, can give us a quick answer. I think it was said already, uh, Europe has the best model, so we just have to be proud of it. We have to defend our values, we have to own them, and we have to be proud of what we do in Europe. I think that's very clear. We have 30 seconds left, so except for Catherine, who have a little more, if there's one thing that you like to retain from this round table, what is your takeaway? Pierre, one sentence. I think we live a huge stress and uh, the, the Europe is uh, awakening and we're really at the table of the big people so uh, and we have to wake up to that had in order to prepare the, to design and think of the future of Europe and how it will be organized I think we'll have to face the issue of differentiation. We'll have more member states, more diverse member states, member states wanting different things with different aspirations and prospects for the future of Europe. Some, as is the case of Portugal, want to integrate more. Some maybe want to renationalize some policies. So we'll have to accept that in the future, probably the European Union will, Union will be more diverse, more differentiated, more flexible, and we'll have to accept flexibility as one of our levers and one of our strengths for the future. Marsha. Marsha, what is your motto? Speaking about the model, I think uh, what we need to show, the biggest quest is to show that the liberal democracy, democracy, the world order, that the rest of the world also would like to follow because it's just better for its citizens. Adam. I mean, I liked, I did like the suggestion of uh, permanent crisis fighting capacity. That strikes me as something that follows that logically from where we've ended up. I already answered, it's our values. Catherine, now you have the floor. Uh, you've heard a lot, so it's difficult to recap everything. All your conclusions were wonderful and full of hope. I feel that if I had the beautiful voice of my friend Anne Perrault, I could have sang you a little song on a theme that is fundamental, which is money, money, uh, but I will refrain from singing. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to spoil a little bit your hope is we're going to have to solve the issues of financing. We're going to get, have to give each other the means to do that, and we have to borrow to get, uh, together as well. It's going to take a while. We can see that we're renegotiating the stability pact, but there's always the same criteria of uh, percentages that are obsolete. So I think we need to dig uh, deeper into that. And there's a second aspect that was mentioned already, but Mr. Ambassador said it, it's the supremacy of politicians over economists. So if we cannot protect our common values in Europe, particularly the values of democracy, if we let populism rise, we will not be able to do anything any longer. The economies will not work and the European Union will not progress. So we need to really defend democratic values. Thank you very much to, uh, this, to all of you and we will let you go. Thank you very much.
we can start, I believe. I think the sound's not very good, but let's go. So, why did Jean-Hervé select me to head this uh, youngster session? It's because I'm the most immature member of the Cercle des Economies. That's why. It was impossible to imagine talking about hope without involving youngsters and without listening to what youngsters have to say because the hope for the future is youngsters. So the event here has launched uh, an a brand new program. It's called the Youth Program. There are over 35,000 youngsters who participated in a national conversation from February to March 2023, talking about three main themes, work and training, health and well-being, democracy and citizenship, and the environment. And these uh, subjects are going to be presented to you by four rapporteurs. We've got Axel Sange Exco, who works for the Red Cross. We have Claire Petriot, who is in charge of a of Les Pépites Vertes, which is for startups working on the ecological transition. Jasmine Manet, who's a young entrepreneur. Do you, you're an entrepreneur, aren't you? There's, there's a neutral noun. Uh, we, uh, she founded Youth Forever, which is an NGO. We have Antoine Joachims, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, founder of Open Politics, which is free training uh, without any uh, political bias. About the training. And we also have the good fortune of having with us Elizabeth Moreno and Jean Dominique Sena to discuss with our youngsters here. So I'm going to hand the floor immediately over to Axel, who is going to talk to us about sport. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Before I talk about sport, I'm going to talk about health, because if you remember, one of the four themes was health. And I'm Axel Sejanes Crow, and on a day-to-day -day basis, I am fighting for youngsters' role in society, in business, in public authorities, in organizations. And uh, over these last eight months, we have been talking to 34,000 youngsters. We questioned them about their health, their well-being, if they're developing and blossoming in society. And 35 of those of youngsters then analyzed the answers, discussed the answers to the questionnaires to, to identify health care, for example. This is a solution which isn't particularly representative of all youngsters, but it will have a very precise impact on one subgroup of youngsters, i.e. students. So the Cyclists Economies have got these uh, youngsters who want to uh, promote the sporting activities in higher education by, uh, well, in all of university structures in France. And so that is the challenge, really. If you remember, there was a plan which was carried out when Pompidou was president here in France to uh, give a fresh boost to um, edu physical education at school. We want to continue that, and uh, we really want to incorporate it into the university cycle. So we want to go even further talking about sport. Sport is great, it's important, but health is cannot be summed up or resumed simply as uh, healthcare. It's, it uh, is the foundation for the rest. So, yes, youngsters, we've just come through COVID, we're all anxious, there's this digital divide, there's a lot of anxious to day-to-day -day life compared to the difference, differences in society. What I want to talk to you about is money. Uh, cash. We all have different uh, terms uh, that we can use to describe money. And I want to reinforce the purchasing power of youngsters because that is the inroad to helping our youngsters with their health care. To help them have m more purchasing power means that they can have a decent place to live, decent food on their plates. They can have free time which they can spend carrying out leisure activities, working for associations and playing sport also. And they can uh, blossom as individuals. And we can also, oh, and enhancing the purchasing power of our youngsters also means giving them better access to health care, uh, especially in, in all situations, including emergencies. 
And the challenge is not only doing it by promoting their purchasing power, but also by considering their urgent needs, mental health, uh, their relationship with digital technologies, their relationship to their bodies. There are all these realities of this generation. Dear partners, all together we have to construct uh, not only in a collective mindset, but also to accompany our youngsters. They aren't just there to receive a service. They have to be helped in their own development as uh, uh, active protagonists in their own life. And that's why we've got these uh, business leaders and these decision takers. We want to question you about how you can help youngsters in their health care. Thank you very much. Donc, euh, alors moi j'avais été démarré. Yes, uh, I thought we were going to talk about sport, but it's much broader than that. It's very important that sport starts before the uh, students reach their higher education. In other countries, sport plays an important role even from primary and secondary school. Sport is good for the health, but it also teaches you a healthy notion of uh, competition and merit. And I think it really is important to develop this. And why not extend this mindset to health of healthy competition to maths? etc. Uh, uh, going into competition without being humiliated, we need to incorporate that into our education system. And uh, I think that uh, jean and I have been working on this for a long time. We need to have a salary for students. So young students have a salary. It's like a universal revenue, if you like. So it can help you either to study or walk or to train. So I think it's great to help the youngsters in that style. So I'm now going to hand the floor over to Elizabeth and Jean-Dominique. They can perhaps uh, react. Well, first of all, I'd like to say how delighted I am to be here with you and to listen to you. When I listen to the responsibilities that you are taking on your shoulder, when I listen to the work that you've done in two months, you've consulted 35,000 youngsters all out of France to get their opinion. It's absolutely outstanding. And I think your, your friends can give you another round of applause. Give yourself a round of applause because it really is teamwork, a huge job. And the, I've got three comments to make. The first is that sport, yes, it is absolutely essential no matter how old you are. And the earlier you start to play sport, then the earlier you get the habit of playing sport all the way through to your 80s and 90s and perhaps beyond. <laughs> Jean-Hervé, what do you think about that? But more seriously, it has been observed that young girls at the age of 14 give up sport regularly, even though they love it and enjoy it, and even though they have the financial means to carry out a sport. So we have to heighten the awareness of youngsters, of, of the parents, make sure that they encourage their children to play sport. Second comment. Sport uh, is, uh, brings with it healthy competition. The best type of competition that you can have is not against others. It's, it's, it's going beyond your own personal record. And yes, Philippe's talked about the uh, risk of humiliation in a competition. I think our schooling system today is not driving youngsters to uh, improve their own performance. They are constantly being told to be in competition with others. Whereas if you guide them to compete with themselves, to develop their own skills, to go and identify their own talents and develop them, then absolutely everybody would win from that situation. I'll finish with my third comment. The situation of uh, students, we, COVID was terrible, of course, and I would like to s commend all of those associations that really did do such a lot of work in the field so that our students could continue to work, although the conditions were difficult, but they were eating and they were housed. And let's, we really did not tip our hats enough to these associations, so let's do that now. Jean-Dominique, yes, of course, I really must uh, echo those comments. I'm absolutely dazzled to see this, these two months of hard work that have gone on. Let's talk about um, sport in general. Very recently, I submitted a report to the French government about uh, the discussion on work. There was a chapter in our work which talked about uh, the question of health at the workplace. And this is a real topic. And you've already said, we, the, the better we address this problem, the healthier we will be. And sport is at the heart of this subject. 
when you take a look at the statistics, you know that today in France we're starting to have a problem of obesity among youngsters. It seems strange to say that, but if we don't tackle that quickly, then we can only look forward to very hard times ahead. And let's say that sport has a role to play here. Another point here is, yes, we are lagging behind in France. When I go abroad, I realize that schools everywhere else in the world are well known, universities are well known for their sports teams. And that is important. It's not the case here in France. So that's uh, another subject. But getting back to the nitty gritty and to be brief, I would say that for 15 years I lived in the Auvergne region of France and I was really keen on rugby. Not necessarily because I played rugby myself, but uh, because I observed what that, the values that that uh, injected into society. And since then, I'm com utterly convinced that if we all could understand this, not only in the uh, world of students, but in the world of business, if we could understand that every time that you success succeed is because you help others to succeed, I think then we will be in nirvana of, uh, of blossoming. And it, it is uh, it's utopia. So you don't, uh, it's not the person who actually marks that try who is important, it's the person who gave them the ball at the right time. That is what counts. Jasmine, the floor is yours. Hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk to you about training and work. The first question is, let's look forward into the future. In 2053, we're at the this meeting here in X, and the question to you is, uh, who will be the men and women who will have put in place, who would have seen their strategies through that we've been talking about for the past three days? Who will be the relays of our organizations? Get, let's get back to today, 2023. The challenge here is to create the conditions of employment, training which will guarantee commitment in political and economical organizations represented by your good selves. So to answer that question, we try to go back in time and come back to our initial school choices. And when we were at high school, uh, to help our uh, youngsters have uh, make the right choices. So what we are suggesting to the government is as follows, for all trade training courses leading to a diploma. We have to publish information relating to uh, the access to jobs after the training session for youngsters. And then information about potential jobs, uh, how long it takes to find a job, remuneration, quality of work at, at quality of life at work. And so we take the into account in our report that we are looking at uh, increased inequalities. Of course, we have to help as well. It's not only a question of uh, revealing, showing, and letting people choose. We have to help in our high schools. We have to help our youngsters so that they can rate, make enlightened decisions. We decided to concentrate on training because this is where it all begins. However, I have to talk about work as well. It is going to be essential for you to chime in as well. You are going to have to help uh, reduce that offset that exists and uh, close the gap between student life and working life and following this and follow this effort through throughout our entire entire lives. That's why we are offering a new generational pact so that we can succeed. I've heard you make appeals over the last three days. We've talked about youngsters a lot. Obviously, we're all um, a bit shaken by this new relationship to work. It's a intergenerational. It's not just between youngsters. History is repeating itself. And it means that I'm going to make an appeal to you today. We are appealing to you because we need you. The youngsters today, we're very, very different. We need jobs, we need security, recognition, transparency, autonomy, and remuneration. But that's not all, because to join your organizations, to join your businesses, we need you, and we will commit so long as we, you meet us, listen to us, and train us, and given what's at stake, also, that you can position us at the very heart of the reactor so that we can uh, see through these transitions that we're all looking forward to. There are 149 of us here in the room. Uh, we're not alone. There's 149 of us. We're ready. Are you ready to, uh, to help us? Well, Jasmine, well done. I think 
Well, I worked on a study for Valérie Pécresse in 2011 on how university can be uh, better in terms of its research and also getting their students onto the job ladder. It's true that those better those universities that are better financed and better managed uh, do best. We have, uh, in the United States, you can assess your professor's lessons. It's not the case uh, here in France. And in the, it's important to be able to assess your teachers. And also it's important to have information about the different jobs that will be at the end of your training course. This, co this uh, culture of placement is really important. A university must be able to say how many students have found jobs in which and which sectors once they've finished their courses. This is important information. So I think this is something which must be underlined. So assessing your lectures and what job opportunities they are, they're two very important things in terms of uh, training and to and helping our youngsters take their decisions but that's not we don't have that in france i'm going to hand the floor now to jean dominique and then back to elizabeth well thank you very much for this 2053 this is what we're looking forward to and i will be about 100 years old by then so i would like to come back and take stock of the situation when i'm 100 years old that being said on this basic uh, question of training, etc., and education. Let's understand uh, in the Renault group, we are making our own university because the needs are such today because of innovation and technology is being revolutionized. We know that we're going to have huge needs in the future for new skills in the future. And we're not going to be able to pluck them up directly. So we are training, we have created our own um, university. We've cha trained uh, hundreds of people over a couple of years. We work with our regional universities to partner up with them. So what I'm saying here is that things will happen because that we know that we are lacking resources and skills and we must not send our youngsters into into specialist fields which do not correspond to them so yes of course we have to identify the needs we're going to do that but let's not make any mistakes there. let's look forward five ten years down the road we need to say uh, today we need this no we have to train the futures for the situation 10 years down the road and that's very very difficult that's our job businesses have that responsibility as for scoring your your lectures and everything well yes that does happen abroad i think it does happen in france in some establishments i would just like to say do not do it as a user or a consumer you are in front of your professors to learn you have to of course pass that message along about your your professors and how they're doing but you do it on your social networks anyway, so the system really do, is in place. But do not do it as simply as a consumer, like we do when we've purchased a, a T-shirt or something, or if you're happy the way that uh, the salesperson dealt with you. Let's be serious about it, and let's think about this in a more structural way. So that's the message I wanted to give to you. It really is important because uh, we are taking that step now, and I think that we will have new situations to look forward to very soon. Thank you very much for these statements. In France, uh, we uh, select people through their failures, and I think we should select more when you stream people. We need to select through streaming. Streaming is not a word that should be banned. It's a selection by failure that is a bad thing. We need to select by streaming. I'll give the floor to Elizabeth. I have several things to say. Who's familiar with the Gallup study? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the Gallup study. You aren't very many. This Gallup poll has been conducted for several years on European label. It's 38 countries, more than Europe, in fact, that are consulted. And people are asked whether they are happy in their work, if they feel uh, engaged, committed. 38 countries are consulted. Imagine the ranking of France. Not the 38th, not the last. We stand at 36. We're 36 out of 38. Wage earners uh, don't feel fully engaged in their work. Hardly one third of French people say they feel committed and engaged to their work. We're a big economic power. If people don't find meaning in their work, if they can't feel they are fulfilled, if they feel they're not properly paid, if they feel they can't progress in their career, 
how can we succeed? And I think in 2050, I'm not sure we'll be here to uh, discuss the matter. The country will be in a catastrophic state. So work is essential. And as you said, the question of streaming is absolutely critical. The number of young people who I've met who've said, young people your age, and who've said, well, I didn't do Sciences Po because I didn't even know it existed. Had I known that Sciences Po existed, my parents didn't have the means to pay for the tuition. Young people who were in rural areas said to me, well, uh, wanted to go to Dauphine, but people couldn't uh, pay for lodgings in Paris, so I didn't go on to further uh, education. If uh, we don't help uh, people, if we don't support young people and tell them what kinds of studies that they could do in order to meet their professional aspirations, then we'll really miss out on, on an awful lot. We'll miss the bus completely. Thank you. Antoine? Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you today. I want to speak uh, on behalf of all these young people about democracy. We've worked on this for about six months. I wanted to take the floor here to say that we're in a country where young people should play their rightful role in politics, but it's not the case. The figures are clear. They're desperate and they uh, uh, are the result of a study amongst 35,000 young people. There are several interesting figures. In the political world, youth uh, uh, which up to the age of 30, between 20 and 30, is not uh, given a proper voice. And people don't, uh, young people don't feel they are part and parcel of the political world. You have eight out of 10 young people next to you, in front of you, behind you, who feel that they're not uh, taken into account by the body politic. We can't continue in that way. If we do without youth, uh, I think a country will be condemned to live in the past. It will be condemned in terms of its future. Young people have a very little voice in the body politic, in uh, democracy and in institutional life in our country. Yet, you have wonderful examples of people who are engaged in this room people who are doing a lot uh, amongst uh, NGOs, but you have to do more in the political world. But we're not given any room to do so, any space. If we're given no space, uh, what can we do? We'll have to just uh, beg. And we'll, we need to hold out our hands to young people. And what we should offer is that uh, young people should stand for election, in municipal elections, for example. And the number of young people would be proportionate to the number of young people in the city. There should be quotas. That's the best solution. It's the least bad solution. So we should forge ahead. With quotas, you can change people's lives. You can change mindsets. You can change the situation. So we're making this proposal. If we apply this proposal in the future, we'll have young people who will be elected. They'll be municipal councillors. They'll be young people will be represented by other young people and above all we'll have young people who have uh, their voice in matters institutional political democratic matters pertaining to the country and i think that would hold out great hope i think you've raised a number of very important issues how can we make a career in politics more attractive? That's another issue. The problem is that politics attracts mediocre people, not the best. It's not very attractive as a profession. How can we attract people who are competent and who are in step with civil society? In France, we chose and choose between very competent people who aren't uh, in phase with uh, society or people who are not as incompetent as competent but who have a link with society how can we have uh, politicians in the future who are both competent and also who don't uh, despise the, the people, civil society. How can we achieve this? How can we encourage young people to become involved in politics without uh, forcing them to join a given a political a party? Uh, these are the questions I wanted to ask following what Antoine has said. I'll now give the floor to Elizabeth. Well, I think that young people are extremely deeply engaged. Young people are no longer committed to politics, unfortunately, but there are a lot of people who are no longer engaged in politics because there's such mistrust vis-a-vis -vis politicians. 
I've met a, a whole host of young people who take up very important causes and not just the state of the planet. I'd like to say that my generation didn't uh, uh, know Greta Thunberg. People are engaged uh, in animal causes, uh, social injustice. M probably more and more people, even than in my generation, are deeply engaged. People are keenly aware of what's happening on this earth. And I'd like to say one thing, you have the power to uh, get things to change. You have the ideas, you have the energy, and you want things to move to change. If things don't suit you today, well then invent a better future. Toni Morrison kept saying, if you want to read a book that hasn't been written, then write that book. I have a huge amount of hope. I have great trust in youth because uh, there are certain issues where my generation didn't work hard enough. We have the matter of education and training, which are of capital importance, and you must take up the matter because that's your, your very future. It's a way of uh, shooting yourself in the foot, perhaps, but I firmly believe that your way of viewing the world is different from ours. The planet, the world of tomorrow, well, you're going to inherit it, so it's uh, up to you to create it. And that doesn't, that uh, entails engagement in civil society and politics. Uh, a while ago, Le Parisien, which has a very enlightened vision of things, it, uh, in its headlines, it said the world of tomorrow, and there were four men, not a single woman, not a single young person. I think that if you want the headlines of the press to represent, to represent what you want for the future of uh, the world, then it's up to you to, to write that future. Thank you. I'd like to say you've said some very important things. The question of engagement, commitment today is uh, very true indeed. I chair the uh, Group Renault and I have seen lots of uh, associations, NGOs uh, created by young people. It's wonderful. And the engagement, the commitment is there. That is quite obvious. There's a second thing I'd like to say. I firmly believe in, in engagement in public life. As a head of a company, a CEO, I, I published a charter. I'm not the only one. Uh, we have a company charter and it states that all employees can engage in politics, whatever the age, whatever uh, the position, and that person will be protected by the uh, company if he uh, fails or if the experience uh, proves difficult. I wanted to offer private uh, sector employees the same thing that uh, civil servants can enjoy, certain privileges uh, to stand for election. I say that because I deeply believe in it. If uh, you have someone who's truly committed to, to this matter, it is indeed me. There's another thing I would like to say. Quotas, well, why not? But for me, quotas is a wooden leg. It's not a solution. The solution is to give you confidence. You have it, obviously. But uh, other people don't necessarily want to see you there because the body politic, often very unfairly, has an image which doesn't represent the true commitment of these young people. We've seen that uh, in recent days. Uh, uh, the conditions are very difficult. You know what I'm referring to. One shouldn't be too unfair. There's one thing we have to deal with, namely when you are a political leader, be it a man or a woman, you have to pro enjoy some protection of your personal life. Now, uh, a politician, be it a man or a woman, are constantly attacked by the media, there is too much uh, transparency requested of them. It's becoming totally impossible. How can these people possibly live normally if they have to justify every single movement, every single activity, every single expenditure? And this will call for a lot of political courage. We have to protect our, our uh, politicians and elected people because they must be able to act uh, calmly and uh, feel that they are sufficiently protected in uh, their profession. Thank you. Last but not least, well, thank you very much. 87%, that's nearly 9 out of 10 young people, uh, answered our survey, and they said they were worried about the climate and about the future. So I have a first question. 9 out of 10 young people are worried about the climate. In the uh, room, is that also true? You're not uh, alone. 
You're not mad. You're quite lucid, clear thinking. If you look at our study, you can see that 17% of people who answer say that they are engaged on a daily basis. Look at the gap. Look at the difference. There's a lot of worries, uh, fear, anger, sadness, no doubt. Many emotions which uh, hold out uh, enormous potential energy when it comes to finding solutions, when it comes to moving on to collective action. So on this basis, in our working group uh, on the environment with members of the circle, we have given thought to a solution which would make it possible to take action because it's that which enables you to overcome your anxiety. We suggest making a citizen service obligatory as of the age of 18. That would make it possible to train young people in terms of environmental and climate challenges and teach them how to transmit, how to uh, uh, also uh, raise awareness amongst their uh, siblings and school children. The idea being to wear, raise awareness uh, so that the uh, citizenry at large becomes engaged. I'd like to draw your attention to this topic. It's important to focus on youth. What we're living at present, what is uh, we see this uh, motivated young uh, pe these motivated young people who want to be involved in the uh, search for problems, uh, solutions to various problems, which are very real, as scientific consensus shows. Climate disruption, the collapse in biodiversity, the uh, uh, dwindling of resources. We need to have this intergenerational pact to tackle all these problems. I'm not here to say we found a solution. We're going to save uh, the planet. We're here to say that we have no choice now. We have to work together because the only generation that counts is the generation of people who are alive now and who can act right now for the sake of the future. It's you and it's I, it's all of us together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Civil society, informing citizens and young people are crucial if we are to combat the global warming. We didn't talk about carbon tax, green revolutions. A lot of recent studies show that consumers have a major role to play. They must be able to say, well, this company is virtuous, this other company is not. There are different systems to assess uh, companies. And I think we should teach everyone to single out virtuous and non-virtuous companies and use competition to push companies to become more green. Civil society is a fundamental part to play in this. And you talked about a national service. That entails a, a lot of training in the environment. These are very stimulating ideas. Dominique might like to react, and then Elizabeth. Yes, indeed. I understand uh, your worries, your concern. The preceding generation was uh, less aware than you are. But I can reassure you, people, uh, things have really changed. When you have uh, board meetings of big uh, French and European, uh, you have board members of big European and uh, French groups, you'd be surprised to see how often they discuss the uh, uh, greening, uh, global warming, the topic of the environment, uh, uh, carbon sinks, uh, well, that's uh, uh, really the topic of the future. We need to find as fast as we can the right technologies to remedy the situation. So seniors, I can reassure you, are not completely out of the picture. They are doing things, they are aware of things, and they know that it's necessary for us all to work together. So I can reassure you, you're putting a lot of pressure on us, and you don't need it. You need us, we can say to you. There are some things which are feasible, others are not. That's the whole point of having some experience. So I do indeed believe that this intergenerational pact is an intelligent solution. That's what I wanted to say. So uh, I think we can all work together. Don't discard seniors. Yes, you're quite right. And uh, a halt to, to growth is not the solution either. The solution is green uh, innovation, change behaviors. And we can achieve prosperity, but green prosperity, I believe it's important to uh, discard the uh, fake or good ideas. 
I'm in favor of green uh, innovation rather than uh, halting or diminishing growth. Thank you very much. It's important what you have said. I was born in a continent where the young generations work with seniors. There is no opposition between the two age groups. We currently live in a society where uh, women are opposed to men, young people versus older people, uh, urban areas versus rural areas. And it's a deadly idea to do that. Uh, we need to work together. It's in that manner that we'll find robust, uh, long-lasting solutions to all the problems we have to face. Having said this, I don't know whether you know, but those who are in uh, uh, companies know 70% of transformation projects in companies fail. 70%. Do you know why? I don't have time to give everyone the floor. These projects fail because it's not enough to know something, to be aware of something, to transform this something. What really enables us to transform things is a change in our behavior, a change in what we believe. We talk about accountability and environmental accountability, societal accountability and responsibility. A lot of companies have done a lot of interesting things in terms of the environment. However, we are now in 2023, and what we realize is that progress is minuscule compared with what is required. When we talk about social matters, when you look at all these young people who over 70% say they're worried about the future, they don't know whether they'll have a job. They don't know what the state of the earth will be. I agree with Jean-Dominique. I think there is still hope. We can change and transform things. But if there's one essential player who can truly transform things rapidly, uh, it's the world, uh, the entrepreneurial world. You have the economic power. You have the decision-making power. Choose the companies with which you want to work. Choose the leaders with which you want to work, and you'll see when you no longer work for companies which don't uh, meet your values, then the world will truly change. Terminé. Merci beaucoup. On applaudit nos jeunes. Well, that's over and done with. Let's give a big round of applause to our youngsters and to our other guests on the panel. Thank you.
Bonjour à tous et bienvenue pour Hello everyone and welcome for this session on food security it's a crucial matter where we have 10 billion people in 2050 where agricultural soils are limited and unequally distributed on the planet the international context today with the war in Ukraine and global warming compels us to uh, dwell into the question of food safety, namely the availability of resources, access to resources, the use that we make thereof, and how can we ensure stability for these resources so as to feed the whole population in the world. So we're going to look into the geopolitical dimension, food safety, but also the role of Europe and the issue of Africa and the necessity to build systems that are inclusive to curb um, hunger. So I would like to give the floor to Kikos Weizenman. Kikos, you have the floor. Hello. You are an economist and you have coordinated this whole session. Hello. I would like to say a few words to introduce this session. Food safety is threatened in the short and long term. Short term because of crisis, the interruption of exchanges during the lockdown due to COVID-19, then the war in Ukraine, which is an exporting country of wheat and fertilizers. Food safety is also threatened, structurally speaking, more structurally than over the long term, because the global change is already happening, and also due to the demographic change. We have to feed 8 billion planet, 8 billion inhabitants. We are uh, reaching a threshold where there are regions where there are less populations and more available soils, and other regions, this is Europe, for instance, and other regions in the world where we have more population and less, uh, less soils where we can farm, we can do farming, like in Africa. So an excess of supply, an excess of demand on the one hand and on the other hand. And for this, we need to have more trade, international trade. So food safety is not only a matter of self-sufficiency. We'll go back to that during this debate. The number of people who do not eat enough has multiplied since 1990 and has multiplied since 2015. I'm talking before COVID and before Ukrainian war. It has touching 10% of the world population and it will be even more the, the case uh, afterwards. So it's the end of the world that touches one uh, out of five people, one out of 10 in Asia and Latin America and even less in Europe and in the US. But in 2030, we think that hunger will touch 670 million people in the world. That's 8% for the world population. We go back to the same rate as in 2015. We haven't made any progress, but 2030 was an objective is an, o, an SDG uh, that we all had and we had an objective that we had set ourselves. Another uh, sustainable development uh, goal was to eliminate poverty, to uh, eliminate malnutrition and to promote sustainable agriculture and this is beyond reach. How can we perceive this objective? How can we reach it beyond feeding the population? We have to ensure healthy food, healthy nutrition, and it needs to rely on a lot of fruit and vegetables. You, knew, you know that these are actually very expensive and they're beyond the budget of uh, underprivileged households. And it touches also the uh, poor and middle class, uh, some middle class households. 
food safety relies on six pillars. The three first pillars is availability and accessibility, namely affordability in terms of price, and the nutritional characteristics. This is what we mean by uh, use. And these three pillars concern not only the farmers, but also the industries and, in and services. These industries and services are themselves reshaping themselves and consolidating themselves. And this has an impact on food safety. Uh, food dependence is not only depending upon some countries, but also some important multinationals that are very large and are very important for our nutrition. Then stability, that's another pillar, especially in times of crisis and conflicts. We should not use food as a weapon, as some countries do nowadays. Another pillar is sustainability, the capacity to regenerate uh, food for the future generations on environmental basis, social uh, basis, but also economic principles. The last pillar is agency. It's a concept that was introduced by Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winner, to make sure that individuals and groups can have a word, can be uh, that their voice can be heard. Nothing about us without us. This is the concept. So, food security is multi-dimensional, multi-stakeholder with objectives and interests that may be contradictory and diverging. How can we find a solution? This is the question that I'm asking to the speakers today. Thank you. Alors, on va poursuivre cette session. So we will continue with you, Michel Barnier. Thank you for accepting this invitation. You are a European commissioner. You are a former minister of agriculture. And you've written a book, Who's Going to Feed the World? You were raising the question in 2008 already. We saw that the Ukrainian war was actually a, a, an eye opener in terms of our uh, dependence uh, with regards to uh, Ukraine. We, the matter of production is also an important question in a changing world. What kind of solutions can you uh, give us on this question? Has Europe a role to play? Hello, each of you. Thank you for your attention. Despite the heat, that's actually part and parcel of the problem that we'll have to tackle. Uh, uh, within this round table. Thank you for your invitation. I'm no longer a European commissioner. I have been for 10 years. And I do have some memories, even though I do not have any nostalgia. I would like to give you some of uh, my uh, input with the experience that I could acquire over my long career. On the European side, first, the uh, common agricultural policy and the danger that it undergoes, and also uh, the Ukrainian war and the place of Europe in the world, because we're not alone, definitely. So on the common agricultural policy, it's a wonderful project. This was uh, misunderstood. That was not well explained. It consolidated the unity. I'm not talking about uniformity. I'm talking about unity around this economic policy. It was the first economic policy that created unity at the time. And it responded to two questions related to food security. First of all, sufficiency. Do we have enough food, enough abundance, and also safety? Is it traceable? and our products need to be safe and the quality needs to be there as well this is the um the deal that we made with the farmers at the time mr blondy can talk about it with me with a dimension that justifies uh, the common agricultural policy it's the financial agreements for the maintenance and livelihood of uh, the territories 
if we were to suppress the common agricultural policy, it would cost much more with what we would have to import because we're not producing enough. And the food would have no taste anymore as we would, the, the food would be the same as what we have in the US. We, we have a lot of quality, a lot of taste, a good traceability right now. And also for the livelihood of uh, the different regions of uh, Europe, we have to adjust, we have to adapt all the time and uh, rise to the challenges, the, um, the uh, pandemics that touch both human beings and animals, the quality of water, research, resistance of products and plants, and a lot of uh, challenges also waste. Ladies and gentlemen, lady, one third of the food that we produce is lost or is subject matter of waste. There's a lot of challenges ahead of us. There's a lot of endeavors ahead of us. I'm saying this at a time where in Brussels, we use a word more and more that is being used in, in the precedent round table, if I heard well, the degrowth. There is an ideology that is gaining momentum in Brussels that is tantamount to say, to pollute less, we have to produce less. I think that we work in a wonderful region not far from here, and I have been minister for several times. I think we should pollute less, but produce more. And I think we can produce more and pollute less with the farmers, with the research and innovation. These are the big challenges. If we produce less in Europe, then we break the deal with the farmers but we also open up gaps. And immediately, the Chinese, the Brazilians, and the Americans will use these gaps for their own benefits. So the big debate in Brussels now is to resist this uh, new theology, ideology uh, of degrowth saying, and I would say that we should pollute less but produce more with the farmers. Second thing, Ukraine. Ukraine and Russia are the large, are two large countries gen, uh, producing cereals, and this destabilizes, destabilizes all markets, including what we see in Ukraine, because it uh, defends sovereignty and their values that are ours as well in Ukraine. When I think that we have to consolidate the perspective of being European with them one day. But everything is all about instability, and, it ha and we have a crisis, a war beyond the solidarity that we owe to the Ukrainians. We have to reduce our dependence, energy dependence, gas, electricity, oil. We have to diversify. We have to depend less on one single partner to have more independence in terms of energy safety, but also in terms of food security. As my wife or myself uh, were looking for uh, for some oil at the time, it was only produced in uh, Ukraine, a sunflower oil, and we could see that we couldn't find it anymore because it was produced in Ukraine. So we have no lessons to give to the world, but we have a role to play, and. It has a, uh, an impact on the order or disorder of the world or chaos in the world. I think we should be patriots, but also Europeans. If we're not Europeans, we're stuck. We're f we're effed. We're effed. And we won't be at the table where the important decisions of the world are going to be made. We're not here to give lessons. We have interests. The others uh, are there and make decisions, and we should have also solidarity. I would like to convey four ideas. First of all, the trade. There's a new word that we have been introducing in the trade negotiations with the EU because this is a European prerogative, namely reciprocity. That's a very important word for agriculture. We do not import products here that do not comply with the standards that we impose that we do not that we impose on our own farmers this is reciprocity second idea cooperation and development we talk a lot about immigration and this will grow in the years to come it's not only a matter of borders 
but it can be also a matter of cooperation with uh, Africa, for instance, whole continents. And uh, as to the riots, because we do not talk a lot about this, but it's not an only a matter of safety, but it's also other solutions that we need to implement. So as for uh, immigration, Africa, we have an interest, but also a duty to co cooperate. And I, when I was a minister of agriculture, there are large African regions in West Africa, Af North Africa, Eastern Africa, and the center have an interest in, as we have done with their own culture, their own methods, their own traditions, something that would be tantamount to a single market, to pool resources. This is something that I like. This is what characterizes the European uh, project. The aim is to pool resources and respect differences, pooling water, pooling all the resources, but also to fight against risks. I'm talking about uh, crickets and everything else. We are uh, stronger together. And if there were to be a common agricultural policy in Africa, it would be easier for us to cooperate with them. That's the second idea. Another idea, we should master uh, agricultural financial markets. I was a European regulator. There's too much speculation. There are some people that do not like uh, the light and uh, they manage everything uh, in the shade and they do not care about starvation and hunger. We should have more star uh, more reporting, more transparency, so that some people in Switzerland or in Chicago do not manage the agricultural markets to the detriment of consumers and producers. The idea is that this could uh, involve a lot of money. We'll have to finance ecological transition, climate, uh, the climate transition, and give that money to some countries that do not have the necessary means to do so. I'm talking with the economists that are quite liberal. I keep, I, I still am convinced, and I had this conviction before, we should have a tax on financial markets at a low uh, rate with a wide basis to get the money that we need to finance the, tr the ecological transition. Thank you. Thierry Blandinière. You are the general manager of In Vivo, the first agricultural cooperative with 10 billion uh, euro turnover. You heard uh, your colleague. Do you share the same view about the uh, challenges ahead of us? We should uh, produce more, pollute less, reduce our dependence, but also the importance of Europe's scalability to have food security. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to come once again despite the heat, but we have to adapt, I would say, on everything that has been said by Mr. Barnier, that we can only be in agreement. And how can we translate it into an economic model for businesses? And how, with uh, public policies, we can respond to the, ex the economic, societal, and environmental expectations? The Ukrainian crisis, the health crisis, has revealed to the public opinion that France had a strong agriculture, we could continue producing, not only for France, but also at the European scale, and that has been said, but also for our friends in Africa. We have increased our production potential to set off some of the lacking volume in Ukraine, and we have exported more cereals to Africa in a significant way over the last months. So sovereignty for us is at the European level. We have to reinforce public policies and the common agricultural policy. It is essential. And we should not uh, uh, put uh, the common agricultural policy into silos. We should have more verticality in this common agricultural policy. When it we, we talk about sovereignty, it's a matter of competitiveness, it's a matter of world fight in a fragmented world with uh, crises back to back. 
and we should not uh, forget uh, all about the common agricultural policy as we forgot everything about our industry, for instance. So we have to use it as an asset for the French consumers, for European consumers, even if the world has changed geopolitically. We have a, a word, our word to say, we have something to say. And it is an important lever, and Putin is using it strongly. In 2014, I would like to remind you, there was the first invasion of Crimea, a few provinces as well. The war started in Ukraine. We talked about it a, a little bit. There was a boycott. The response from Putin said, well, I am I'm rebooting my agricultural policy before they were importing French cereals. And now it's the first exporter, or exporting country of cereals. So you can see the resilience of the Russian economic model. We should not underestimate it. And geopolitics in, in Africa is terrible for us because we can see the Chinese settling in everywhere in Africa. And we see also the Russians coming in in terms of food security. More and more we see them. And we are in the margin in Algeria, for instance, which was an essentially a country which had a strong bond with France, orders most of its cereals in Russia, half of it. And we have to react. We have to make uh, relevant proposals and be competitive. It's 20 euros, uh, the, uh, the 20 euros the ton is actually less expensive than for, Rush for others. So we need to have a competitive edge. We need to have competitive prices to be on a level playing field to be sustainable. Because inflation is a real problem, it has been said. The right level is a, a common ground in terms of price. So we can continue to export worldwide for the sake of our agriculture and know-how. It needs to be sustainable. It needs to be innovative. And we need to be a pioneer agriculture in the agricultural world at large. We are a big agricultural country in France. We've had a lot of talents in terms of innovation in France. We need to recreate that innovative fertile ground when we talk about agriculture, we talk about fertilizers, GMOs. When we talk about GMOs, we talk about NBTs, you know, the dogmatic assimilations that exist today in Europe, which is not a subject in other countries of the world. I don't know if we're going to reach the end, but the discussions that we have to try to dec decouple the NBT, the natural hybridization of plants, and not to assimilate them to GMOs is a solution and an answer to the equation of having a more sustainable agriculture. There are solutions on the table today. And at the European scale, we need to have big champions to fight against the big competitors in the world. Agriculture is fragmented. But in the world, you have uh, four or five large corporations that regulate uh, all uh, the agriculture, the famous ABCD, and none of them is in France. It w we had one, but it went to Switzerland. So we have to recreate large European champions. We have to imagine and discuss with the Germans to create an urbers of agriculture so that at the European scale, we could have a big European uh, economic champion to be able to um, uh, see eye to eye with the other competitors in agriculture. We need to have an economic stakeholder that can be at the right size. This is our project, and we need to finance innovation and sustainability. Thank you. Yes, you are the Associate uh, General Director and also Vice President of the MEDEF, the Employers' Trade Union in Senegal. You've, talked, you've heard talk about uh, cooperation with Africa. Is food security an ongoing concern in Africa, in uh, Senegal and in Africa at large? Does it go th through this uh, cooperation with Europe? Do you have other solutions to ensure uh, food security? Thank you. I'm delighted to speak today during this uh, mecca of the economy 
I congratulate and thank Mr. Lorenzi for the wonderful welcome, but also the quality of the speakers and uh, speeches. I'm the Associate Director General of uh, the uh, Eurogerm. This is something that I created in 2002. It is a group that has 13 subsidiaries in the world, in the US, Latin America, in Africa, in Maghreb, and so in North Africa. And we create technological solutions for the use of flour for food industry. In Senegal, we have a subsidiary which is very important because we produce, we market, and we sell in Senegal, but also in sub-regions. So to answer to Mr. Barnier's question, Senegal is in an area which we call MOA. There are eight countries with a single market which facilitates the sale of our product from Dakar to Abidjan or from Dakar to Bamako and in other countries. I would like to seize this opportunity as well to pay tribute to Senegal, our president for went the third mandate. It's very important for the stability of the area because more than three countries of these regions are led by soldiers after coup d'etat. And I think that our president made a speech online, and it's important to underline the economic stability of our country, which is uh, part and parcel of our tradition now. We have a stable country turned towards emergence. Thank you. You know, food safe security in Europe, like everywhere, is a matter of economic sovereignty. This is a lesson that we learned from COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine. In Senegal, but also in most African countries, there was we really were frightened by the war because we're all importing nearly inclusively uh, cereals from Western countries in Ukraine, in Russia. So we had to react and respond. 800,000 tons of wheat are imported. Egypt is one of the first importing countries, 10 million to of tons. With Algeria, 7 to 8 million tons. Morocco, 7 to 8 million tons. Tunisia. So. Uh, against this dramatic backdrop, because we were very close from a situation where we die of starvation, the countries have responded well. And for Senegal, the local response and uh, what happened was that we gathered the stakeholders and the state took very strong uh, policies, budget measures for wheat to maintain the price of bread. So the VAT was renounced on wheat, but also customs tariffs, so as to maintain the price of bread, which is an in indispensable component of Senegalese food. This is a measure that the state took, but also they did the same for gasoils. They uh, gave away a lot of subsidies. They uh, curbed their portfolio so as to enable the population to continue having uh, reasonable uh, uh, prices for food. For wheat, we initiated the culture, the harvesting of wheat. It is essentially harvested in the north. Uh, some countries uh, do produce it, but very little. The lesson has been learned to reach this food sovereignty We've uh, participated into that. There were some uh, pilot projects, some perimeters have been outlined, and we've obtained uh, some interesting crop results. The main difficulty is the identification of some varieties, because there are some weeds that are uh, uh, harvested in Europe, but they cannot be harvested in Africa. So some varieties gave uh, a lot of uh, reasonable and significant yields. We've had correct outcomes. 
and had uh, also high quality flowers. Some countries like Senegal and Nigeria initiated the Swede uh, have, uh, production and we managed to have uh, significant quantities of wheat. Another uh, thing was to diversify. We have uh, millen, sorghum and other types of cereals and the state has also launched the production of uh, special breads to incorporate these local cereals. Some stumbling blocks that we encountered, however, were the fact that the wheat went down to a normal level 240 euros per ton. The price w went back to normal. So the state now can catch a breath. But we have limits in terms of uh, property, of land restrictions and the price of these cereals because millet is not harvested enough in in Senegal that's the problem of supply and demand these cereals well we need a strong political will to develop other cereals and with the technology we can boost research and uh, development and have other type of bread sorts thank you Alain Chibozo, your chief economist with the Western African Bank of Development. A word on the development of the bank, the WAD, and how does it uh, tackle the challenges of food safety today? And uh, as Amadou Sek said, does Africa have the capacity to reach its own food sovereignty, or uh, even more, to be part of the world uh, trade game? Thank you uh, for giving me the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, I absolutely agree with what uh, Mr. Sex said. Africa has the capacity, the potential to, uh, to reach what you call food safety. We are a development bank. The Western African Bank for Development is the bank that finances all the projects of development of the eight countries of the CFA uh, area. So that's 100 million inhabitants. Uh, the GDP is about $1,000 uh, per, uh, per, per, uh, per uh, person. So what is the issues in terms of food safety? When you finance development in our country, 60% of the jobs are linked to agriculture. And the GDP uh, is, represents 6%. So if you don't finance, if you finance development without financing agriculture, it's not going to work. The second problem that we have is we start very low, which for the last 40 years, most of the efforts have been to say, well, let's finance development with, do with donations. But in fact, it doesn't work because donations are not sustainable. Sometimes you get some, sometimes you don't. And it doesn't work uh, at all because our populations double every 20 years. So we would have to have the donations also being doubled every 20 years, which is not the case. So we find ourselves in a deadlock. And, um, and we decided to create new mechanisms and to uh, reinvent uh, how we can invest and how we can get some money, resources, funds to rebuild the ecosystem. Because this is only when the ecosystem will be well done well built that will be able to attract producers, um, partners to develop our agriculture. Today, agriculture in our country, just one figure, the yield per hectare in cereals, the most advanced in our area is the uh, Ivory Coast. It's two ton per hectare. In Sahel and Niger, we had 2,000 tons per hectare. So that's, you know, numbers to give you an idea. The U.S. are eight tons per hectare, and I think you are over six tons. So oh, above four tons, you start to be able to think about having to do an agriculture that is less polluting, etc. But we're not there yet. We're just uh, trying to have the right quantities for the moment. And uh, we don't have uh, enough mechanized equipment. So. The mission of the Development Bank is uh, to manage uh, the urgency on because we were doubling uh, our population. We have to feed everyone. 
the price uh, after the Ukraine war, the, the price of raw materials has increased. We have to manage all that. But at the same time, we cannot use 100% of the resources that we're getting on this urgent matter because we also have to look at the future of our children, grandchildren, thinking, you know, if there's no education, if there's no schools, universities, they'll never have the scientific level to be able to contribute to uh, to the world. Uh, with uh, Where you uh, developed countries, you're already battling the Chinese. So there's a lot to be done. And that's our mission. So how do we do it? First of all, we have three principles. The first one is you, we can't do it on our own. So we have to get all the goodwill that we can. We have partners. We have partners in Europe. We have partners in India. We have partners in China, knowing that each of these partners bring us a lot. Second thing is among the priorities, uh, we have to uh, make hierarchy in the, pri in, in the priorities. As long as we don't have access to what we call uh, sustainable and affordable energy, we're not going anywhere. Without energy, we cannot draw some water. The pump is not going to work without energy. So we need an energy that is accessible to everyone. Without energy, you don't have uh, cold. Uh, you know, the, the, the products are not, uh, are going to go rotten and they're going to go in the bin because 20 uh, meters, there's no road. And there's lots of people, 20 uh, kilometers away, there's people who would love to eat this, um, these fruits or these uh, vegetables before they get rotten, but there's no way to get it to them. So the energy will allow us to make uh, agriculture, to mechanize uh, the agriculture, to, uh, to do some um, food uh, uh, production. We need a lot of money for that. You know that these are investment programs that uh, need require billions of uh, dollars. So to do that, our uh, our job is to uh, explain to all the donors, to all the people who have money, to all the people who want to invest, what is their interest in investing and in helping us solving our challenges. What do they have to benefit from it? If let me take a very simple example. Nigeria, it's a 200 million inhabitants, two, no, 200 billion, sorry, inhabitants. So it's going to be more populated than the United States of America. So we have to make sure that all this uh, population have access to food safety. And if we talk about uh, food safety, we're going to have to deal also with the safety of um, uh, of the producers. Climate change, 90% of irrigation comes from uh, rainfall in our area. But with all the, the disruption in uh, with the climate, sometimes rain comes too early, sometimes they come too late, and they, you know, crash, it crashes everything. So if the producer cannot recover from those crises, there won't be any more producer the year after. So there's a question of food insurance, agricultural and insurance. We got to insure them. And this is our job. Talk to bankers, talk to insurers, talk to donors, um, talk to all of those who see that there's an interest to build this. Because by doing this, we will manage to create what we haven't done yet, which is securing the food consumption of a population that keeps growing. You know, the, the average age in, in our continent is 20 years. So they're going to keep growing. And, uh, and when, so this is, a, this is a real issue. In order to do that, we have to build infrastructures. Infrastructures, we often say that the problem with infrastructures is that we are risky countries and people don't want to invest there because to build infrastructure because there's too much risk. The reality is uh, infrastructure, building an infrastructure requires energy. We have solar energy, we have a windmill, it's free. Um, we start having a good technology coming from China and India. And uh, the interest of those technologies is that they're still affordable, they're not expensive, but we need partners to help us to help us to know, to, to do things, to teach us how to do it. 
And often these partners are reluctant to come because they say like, okay, if I bring, uh, you know, uh, such amount of money to develop a country, given the governance of your countries and what's going on, I risk to lose these uh, 100 units of money that, you know. And the real problem with private investors is they don't want to find themselves in the situation where they lose everything or most of what they brought. So us as a development bank is to tell them is the risk uh, of loss is limited to a certain stage of development of the project. And as you know, all development projects are over a very long cycle, 10 years, 15 years. So instead of telling them we're going to use all our resources to finance some pumps, we look for partners who will invest to make pumps. And at the start of the project, when there's a risk of loss, we're going to ensure ourselves this risk of loss. And if it happens, well, we'll take care of it. If it doesn't happen, that's even better. The investor is happy. He's uh, reassured. He's going to build some pumps. And you're right, uh, Mr. Barnier, when you say that uh, we need to have a common market. Of course, we're going to do a common market when the uh, free trade uh, area in Africa. Yes, we have to do it. But before we do that, before we raise all the barriers, we have to we have some steps to go through because there are too many discrepancies yet. We have some places in the south, on the coast, we have infrastructures, and then you go in the north, you go closer to Sahel, there's no more infrastructures. And if you hear about security issues, you know that uh, ISIS, uh, you know, the, the people who work for ISIS, they, they, uh, they fight for ISIS, they destroy infrastructure as well as people. So who's going to build them back? So everything is linked. There's a security, food safety, security on its on its own, security of the producer. I don't want to be too long, but it's a passionate, it's a fascinating debate. Thank you. Catherine Megan, you are vice president and general counsel of the International Fund of Agricultural Development. You have a global approach. You say that if there's crisis, that means that there's hunger in the world. What solution do you propose to stop that vicious circle? Um, intervenir en anglais. Uh, it's true that there is a vicious and growing cycle between hunger and crisis. We've heard this morning many crises we're all aware of. The war in Ukraine, the increasing prices of food, fuel, fertilizer, the impacts of climate change, particularly for agriculture, where much of agriculture in the developing world is rain-fed, the need for long-term investment and de-risking of products to channel long-term investment into agriculture. Sadly, today, this vicious circle of hunger and crisis remains. In 2022, 1.3 billion people globally were food insecure. And today, there is more conflict in the world than any year since the United Nations was created in 1945 with an estimated two billion people living in countries afflicted by conflict. So we need to break this vicious circle of hunger and crisis. We know that crisis drives hunger and hunger feeds crisis. And to address this, I believe we need a multifaceted approach with long-term investment in agriculture and food security in the developing world. 80% of the extreme poor live in rural areas. And rural ex areas are exactly where IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or FIDA en français, is focused. And it's working together with a multifaceted approach. What does that mean? I mean long-term investment, looking, as Akiko said, about sustainability, about agency, having rural communities be at the center of their projects and make their own choices about how to build and continue vibrant rural agricultural communities, using ICT for development, 
bringing in the best agricultural techniques and learning from others. These are parts of the multifaceted approach. I'd like to give you just a very quick example of an EFAD project um, to give you a real sense of the type of work that we do. We were founded in the 1970s in response to the then food and fuel crisis. And we're seeing now a crisis of the same, perhaps even greater proportions globally. Um, and I picked uh, Senegal because I thought it would be a nice follow-up to the wonderful uh, words that you shared with us. As you may know, over the past decades, about 40% of Senegal's coastal mangrove uh, forests have been decimated by climate change, including continued drought. And this has an environmental impact, yes, but it has a massive economic impact because without the mangrove trees on many coastal areas, the villages in those areas, as well as the farms behind them, are at risk of being completely washed away. So EFAD has been investing in cooperatives led by women to rehabilitate these areas and rehabilitate the mangroves. This protects the coastal villages, as well as allows the traditional farming, and we've worked to increase and introduce new high value add farming, in this case, oyster production. I wanted to tell you very quickly the story of one farmer, Marianne Ndong, who is leading a female cooperative now producing oysters which attach to the roots of the mango trees in the sea. They've built capacity and know-how across the cooperative. And not only do they produce oysters, but they jar and package oysters so that they can be sold at a much, more, a much higher price and have a much more successful crop. Today, Marianne says that not only is her village protected from being wiped away from the sea, but furthermore, she is a successful entrepreneur. She's able to send her children to school and reinvest in her community. That's the type of sustainable long-term investment that is needed in agriculture. I'd like to also just say a very quick word about the need for inclusivity in agriculture. I was really struck by the inspiring um, session that we had on Friday night with uh, Madame Christine Lagarde and others asking, where are the women? And I'd like to focus that on agriculture. You may know that about half the world's food calories are produced by women. And yet women hold title to only 15%, one five percent of land globally. If women had full access to the same agricultural production resources as men, up to 150 million people would escape hunger. That is a powerful and startling statistic, and it shows, I believe, the importance of full inclusion. I believe with multifaceted approaches and inclusiveness, together we can tackle hunger and crisis and break this vicious circle. Alors, il nous reste... So we now have a few minutes left, a few precious minutes before concluding. So I'm going to ask each of you in a few minutes if you had a challenge that you wanted to put forward to ensure food safety, which one would it be? Uh, Michel Barnier, do you want to start? Uh, one minute each, no more. It's not an easy question. It's too uh, global. Uh, food safety for who and uh, where? It's not the same thing uh, to answer that question. In countries where Michel, Mr. Chibozo talked about, uh, in Nigeria and elsewhere, with uh, Nigeria, sorry, where there's also some uh, political insecurity than in France, for example, in Europe. So um, um, the challenge is to have an ecological growth for me. And that could be applied to everyone with some uh, different issues uh, for everyone. I think Europe has to keep fighting for this uh, ecological growth, be remaining a land of production, food production, 
and be able to cooperate and transfer in terms of research, agronomic, uh, robotics, uh, digital research, all the elements that agriculture needs for this agriculture growth. So agriculture growth for uh, Michel Barnier, Thierry Blandinière. No, I don't really have much to add. Maybe sustainable growth, more innovation. Explain that innovation is the key and invest more in innovation and research. Let's imagine new plants, maybe that could be resistant to drought. Invest more collectively uh, at the scale of public policies at the European level, level with the visibility on Africa. Uh, not to remain focused on uh, Europe and show that Europe is part of the solution because in Africa we know that we'll not be able to feed 100% of the population with a local production and uh, be, uh, do some partnerships with African countries to co-construct some sustainable um, networks. Alain Chibozo. Uh, I would say that I agree. 100%. Uh, my conclusion is to uh, make of us the West uh, African Development Bank of somebody who's bringing solutions. We're open to everyone, we're open to every uh, goodwill. It's a duty for everyone. If we don't solve these issues, these issues uh, will have to be exported. So I'd rather see our countries and our development bank as bringing solution than to leave it down to the generation of my children. We're going to still talk about exporting our problems towards you. Catherine Megan. Investment in agricultural development. It's not only the morally right thing to do, it makes political sense and financial sense. Morally, investing long-term in agricultural development is the only way we're going to reach SDG 2, no hunger. Politically, food security is national security. It decreases migration, decreases the link between crisis and hunger. And financially, investing $1 today in long-term agricultural security can save up to $10 tomorrow in emergency food aid. Am I the sick? Oui. Am I the sick? Yes. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the challenge is the price. <laughs> because the priorities are not the same in Africa and in Europe. I'm talking about wheat. There are wheat vi varieties of AG GMOs, like in Argentina and in Brazil and other large countries. They have authorized the importation of this wheat. Should now, should we in Africa talk about sustainable development and traceability? Well, and let the populations be in a situation of hunger? Or should we allow some uh, uh, varieties where uh, food security could be uh, found? And that's, uh, we, we do not have the same dilemmas, and I think we should take uh, in this into consideration. Kiko, uh, to wrap up this session, a few words. I think that we have learned during this session how to tackle food uh, safety by going beyond the notion of humanitarian crisis to go through st structural dimensions. Food is a human right. This is tantamount to the dignity of human beings. Food sovereignty at the individual level and we should find some sort of food sovereignty, maybe at n not at the national level, but at the, the regional level the different regions of the world. And if I should say one word, I would say interdependence, cooperation. These are the takeaway words. Thank you for your attendance and participation. And I wish you a wonderful end of day. Thank you.
Bonjour à toutes et à tous, je suis François Langlais, TF1 RT. Hello everyone, I'm François Langlais, I work for TF1, uh, French TV and uh, RTL, which is a French uh, radio. This last session is called Parole d'espoir, Words of Hope, and I will be moderating it uh, with the coordination of Françoise Benamou, who is the vice president, no, president of the Cercle des Economies, And she is the one who's going to introduce the discussion. Francoise, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, Francois. Hello, everyone. I would like to mention an article in Esprit, a magazine in 2023, where the philosopher Azande Teresa Janji uh, talks about the slogan of uh, uh, Iranian women, uh, women, life, uh, liberty, which is a cry for the end of totalitarianism. She says, hope has taken over from distress and enables us to reconcile ourselves with the progress of liberty in history. So let me pay tribute to the fight of uh, Iranian women and everyone in the world who's fighting for freedom and democracy. All along our encounters, we have uh, talked about hope, uh, we have talked about the issues and problems. First of all, economically, we underscored the resilience of our economy. When you talk about France, unemployment is being reduced, inflation as well, industrialization seems to be back. But economic resilience uh, is not equal to uh, societal resilience, and we've had upheavals extremely violent upheaval. So now the idea is to go from a society of violence and resentment to a society that is making headway. Let me get back to four topics that have been uppermost during the uh, rencontre. First of all, technology and innovation. When faced with the development of AI, and uh, we oscillate, uh, we balance between uh, fascination and worry. It's uh, like Aesop uh, used to say, the poison and the remedy. Progress uh, in health, in, uh, in research and in defense uh, come at a time where people are becoming aware of the fact that AI is not a danger but has to be regulated. And we've seen this increasing awareness even in American technology. So we have to take into account these progress uh, and uh, make headway. Second point, uh, uh, research can benefit from exchanges uh, uh, amongst uh, researchers throughout the world, but the world is more and more fragmented. I've heard uh, several times that Europe has become a peripheral continent, uh, but nevertheless, uh, in view of uh, the war, our continent has uh, reacted in the right uh, way despite our disagreements. I mentioned uh, the people's uh, rising. Our democracies are uh, being challenged in our Western world. Uh, democracy is a fight. Uh, we, will f uh, we will win it. This is the first uh, fight. Third point, we talked a lot about climate and env at least environment uh, uh, during these rencontres, and it's obvious, an obvious point. When faced with anxiety and disorders, uh, three elements uh, give us hope. First of all, the awareness, and uh, this is obvious, uh, the increasing awareness every day with a change in our modes of living, with a desire to get away from waste. Uh, secondly, the ability to adapt uh, uh, when faced with the brutal shocks and the increase in energy and knowing that we're uh, able, of, uh, we're capable of a lot of resilience. So there's hope even on the side of climate, even despite this heat, uh, hope is there. And then the last point, hope, hope is also something that is uh, present in the neighborhoods. Very often, we all too often see these neighborhoods in their more somber aspect, but we want to answer it with three words, school, school, and school. Education, education to train, education to increase the skills. We need that, it has been said, but also education to remind people of the values of the Republic. Education, but we must also build an economy with free time for the youngsters so that they have jobs, but they have time, which is not an empty time, but a time that will give time, them 
uh, moments uh, to uh, to take uh, these side paths. So we have uh, several speakers here with us, three here and a fourth who is uh, remote. Thank you, Françoise, uh, for uh, presenting these uh, words of hope. Three young speakers, as you said. First of all, Victor Storchan, who is a specialist in uh, AI, which is an expertise at the limit between uh, technology and finance. He's going to decode this word. With him, we have Ava Jamshidi, uh, an international reporter in L. She has covered areas uh, uh, in the planet where there's a lot of problems of hope. And we also have Melati Vishzen, who is a young activist in climate. Unfortunately, she could not be here, but she's on the screen and she's following our discussions. And we'll come back to her. And next to me, Fatih Benjilali, who is the uh, former breakdance world champion. And he will tell us about the hope as he sees it in his daily commitment and in French cities and neighborhoods. They will uh, all have four to five minutes, and then there'll be a discussion here on stage and with you. Uh, Françoise will conclude. And uh, to finish, we have prepared a surprise for you. Victor, let me start with you. As Françoise said, uh, the new technologies, and this is nothing new. It has always been the case. Uh, we've always had fears, whether rational or irrational. For you, uh, when contemplating the future, can you tell us uh, wha uh, how we can see some uh, sprouts, uh, some hope sprouting behind uh, all these fears? Uh, thank you, Francois. Uh, I, uh, if you look at uh, history in the history of AI, all the greatest uh, experts uh, have made wrong predictions, like Jeff Hilton, who said in 2015 that we would not have to train radiologists uh, by 2050 as the machines would uh, do it for them. So let's uh, remain extremely humble as far as our predictions are concerned. The productivity gains uh, from AI in the 20th and beginning uh, of the 21st century were mainly directed at mass consumption with uh, technological progress, which was mainly biased towards uh, the most competent people and uh, uh, the in terms of uh, uh, computer uh, and IT. Uh, in the 21st century, we will be able to understand how we can use AI for sustainable consumption in order to aim at sustainability. There have been extremely interesting uh, uh, studies that have shown that the use of chat GPT, for example, could uh, 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 help uh, the weaker people uh, uh, have uh, more uh, competitivity gains. We've looked at doctors, at all kinds of uh, professions, and we see that uh, the weakest can increase their productivity, and this is most interesting. As Francoise uh, said earlier, If we want to turn the result of this academic research into something practical over the long term, we have to work at social level to help introduce this in the industry. And obviously, we must work on the political alliances and a global governance. Very quickly, three points. concerning a possible approach. First of all, let's deconstruct uh, the speech of exponential uh, curves. Uh, when uh, you hear about that, uh, you might be paralyzed and think, well, why act if in whatever we do, there is a technology? Uh, 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 whatever we say, the research phase, whether you talk about AI or other sciences, is a long-term uh, process. Uh, this morning, we talked about the long-term. And if you look at uh, uh, the DARPA, uh, things uh, are uh, made over the long-term with the right balance between uh, 
uh, the right balance uh, of mindset of uh, American entrepreneurs that must help us uh, see the future and at the same time uh, uh, programs you know uh, driverless cars started in 2004 uh, teams uh, did not uh, decide uh, one morning that they would produce chat GPT they'd been working on it for decades so second thing we must act in order to have a, a plural approach uh, integrating several dimensions. There is something that seems to be underestimated in France, whether you talk about uh, industrial or public research. I'm talking about communication. If you sit uh, several people uh, uh, around a table, IT people, engineers, whatever, compliance people, you have conflicts. Uh, we must learn to talk together. And for that, there are most interesting initiatives, uh, for example, NGOs in the US uh, that are combining civil society and companies and uh, asking themselves how we can uh, communicate, what taxonomy, what vocabulary we can use to communicate, not in our small ecosystem, but when we try to talk to public decision makers or civil society in general. Very quickly, Victor, because we are pressed by time. Well, to conclude, I will just say that the last variable I wanted to mention is that of training, training within companies. and. Uh, when you want to support automation, there's an essential role of uh, social partners, not only to support training, but uh, to offer uh, a training that is appropriate. Thank you, Victor. Well, we'll come back to the various elements you mentioned. Ava, let me turn to you. You're an international reporter. You're going places where hope uh, is difficult to have. Uh, uh, you've been to Afghanistan. You're Iranian. You're not allowed to go to Iran, but you follow what's happening there with a lot of passion, I guess, and a lot of commitment. In those places where hope is such a difficult thing, how how is it that despite everything, people still hope in these places? It's true that it's very difficult when you're a journalist and uh, you are supposed to talk about trains that come in late uh, to summarize things in this way. It's difficult uh, to uh, maintain hope and uh, to make sure that our readers do not want to just throw the magazine away. If I think of Afghanistan or Iran, where uh, whether I'm Iranian or not, uh, journalists can't go to Iran these days. It's forbidden. So in those places, there is a lot of energy, a lot of initiatives that, that being of low noise initiatives uh, that are being carried out uh, as concerns Afghanistan, for example. And in Iran, there is a cultural revolution ongoing today and this is fed into by the uh, desire to uh, uh, maintain the rights that we tend to forget a bit. Francois, you uh, said uh, some words at the beginning, and these words are words that Iranian people who are following the social media uh, consider as very important. This, is, uh, this helps them a lot. So when we... Uh, um, we show our uh, that we're upset. It may sound uh, somewhat cosmetic for some, but I can tell you that when I talk to Iraqi people, to Turkish people, the words of hope that we can give them are extremely important to them. Now, to talk about uh, hope that is difficult uh, uh, to keep in these countries where uh, women have uh, so little rights, the situation is such for them that they feel that if they don't fight, there is no future for them. And they, if they can take uh, um, antidepressant, uh, uh, well, the only thing they can do is fight at whatever uh, price. If you look at the pictures from Tehran this morning, you have women who go shopping without uh, a veil. 
where, who go shopping with their showing their hair, and they're risking their life doing that. By throwing this garment uh, at the risk of their life uh, for them, this is essential, an essential goal. Even if the aim, in view of the highly conservative regime, they do not want to go back in time. They prefer to pay the price of that. And what they're asking us is uh, to relay and to convey their fight as we can't go there. For them, it's absolutely essential and fundamental that we should convey uh, their energy, whether in France and abroad. Uh, it's important to remind people that this is the first feminist uh, revolution in the world that is really being covered uh, uh, by the Western media. So it's extremely important to continue conveying the message and behind that, uh, there's probably hope for us. It's essential to remember that all the rights we consider as granted are not granted. We have to fight for them. Just look back at history. We did not have these uh, rights uh, some decades ago, even in France. And it's important to uh, exert these rights as uh, women and men. I heard that there might be some problems uh, with the Copé Zimmerman uh, law or the Sovadem uh, law, uh, the quota policies. Uh, but all these uh, rights have enabled us to improve the situation of gender equality. And it's essential that we should continue fighting in France as well to reach the goals and uh, convey the initiatives. There's a lot of them, uh, whether in France or elsewhere. If we talk about clandestine uh, schools that are built uh, secretly in Afghan cellars or in Iran, women uh, going uh, shopping unveiled uh, to promote their rights. Thank you. Thank you. As we listen to you, we understand the expression which is called the energy of despair. We understand that the energy of despair is almost hope. Melati, let me turn to you. You're in the Netherlands. Uh, you're a young activist in terms of climate. Uh, the question I feel like asking you is the following. The traditional levers uh, that uh, climate activists use to mobilize us is to frighten us, showing us the curves, uh, showing us the indisputable evolution of climate change in order to lead us to change our behavior. But when you use fear, it's efficient, it's true, but can you at the same time give people hope? Did you hear the question? Sorry, I don't, I don't know if that was addressed to me or not. Yes, it was. It was. Can you repeat? My question was the following. How can you give people hope in terms of climate when we know that in the indicators are deteriorating and that to correct all that, we would need considerable efforts? I'm really grateful to be here, and I think it's such an important topic and question to ask. We're living in a world where there's so much happening, good and bad, it can feel overwhelming. I started my journey at 12 years old, and perhaps that's maybe also the um, the, the, the secret of what allowed me and my sister to take action, because when you are 12 years old, my sister was 10, the world, the sky is not even the limit. We only think in hope, we only think in what is possible. And I think using that ability and playing with imagination, we are able to invite people to be part of this movement. I think, as you said, ruling or leading with fear keeps us stuck, and that's the last thing we need. We need to be able to accelerate the change that we know is possible. But we can't get there if we cannot imagine it. So I think being hopeful in this movement is one of the most important ingredients. And I'm from a generation that is grounded in hope. So I think it's really leading by example 
with a narrative and a communication that is open and inviting. We know that the science is telling us that we cannot continue as business as usual. We need that change and that change has to happen now. But there isn't one way to create change and this is what gets me so excited also to hear from the other speakers and their incredible ways of creating change. This is important because we need everybody in this movement. Are you a journalist? Are you a technology expert? Are you a teacher, a professor, a farmer? We need the skills of everybody in this movement. And I think that this is an empowering narrative so that people don't feel stuck. People don't sit in the fear, but they acknowledge their unique skill set and contribute that to the movement. So I think that's how we remain hopeful by celebrating everybody's ability to be part of this change. Thank you, Melati, for this inspiring uh, message. Euh, Fatih, je, je me tourne vers vous maintenant. Euh, C'est vrai qu'en France, on a connu. C est, c est... Fatih, there were some riots last week. So, uh, terrifying days, uh, tragic days, dramatic days. So today, how can we bring back hope in those neighborhoods and districts that have been uh, bashed? So, what kind of hope can we uh, give uh, to these uh, people? So you are uh, committed uh, uh, to uh, cultural action in cities as part of the 2024 Olympic Games. What is your take on that? So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I thank you, Françoise and François. So, of course, I mean, we do relate to what has happened recently. We don't have a solution. You can't get a solution overnight. With the health crisis, we hoped that we could get an answer overnight. So I was born in Gardin, a city between Aix and Marseille. I grew up in a very hostile environment. So uh, I was on the streets and I discovered urban cultures. Urban cultures are part and parcel of the intangible and moral heritage. And uh, breakdance is part and parcel of the Olympic Games now. So without uh, hip hop culture, oh, thanks a lot, by the way, for your round of applause. Without uh, hip hop culture and without urban cultures, neither ever would have been able to discover Camus, Musset, Rousseau, Descartes, and the people were hostile to me. So I went to the United States for the first time a few years ago. If we can dance together, we can live together. And of course, we need uh, to take into account our cultural and sporting activities. We got a label uh, from uh, 2024 Olympics. So within the public authorities, we need to take into account the uh, city policy, but that's not enough. So I'm just uh, talking about my own experience. So we need to put culture, sports at the center. Genius doesn't come the street, but genius appears when you are supported and helped and backed. So for me, so I represented my region. Something was uh, something unprecedented. So education should be based on democratic values, patriotism, and republican values. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, uh, Fatty. As part of your career path, can you tell me if uh, somebody helped you to be hopeful? Was there a kind of a tipping point? To be the world champion with uh, citizenship awareness and you spend a lot of time with people. Was there a turning point? I met an instructor and he I'm in uh, favor of the military service, not uh, the old one. But it's important, I mean, to focus on sports and culture. We have manual intelligence. I remember this instructor that I met and we practiced in the streets. 
and he was uh, 50 years of age. He told me, what do you do? And I told him, break dance. So what does it require, break, break dance? Resilience? Yes. So go on, go ahead. And uh, resilience uh, is uh, deeply rooted into my mind, and that's why I decided to tour the world. OK, continue along that path. So uh, bef Victor, you talked about uh, the social issue with uh, AI. So less productive people will become more productive. It uh, shouldn't be a technology that will wind up, widen up the uh, cultural and social gap. Can we believe in that? Yes, of course. But we need to support a change. Society needs uh, changes through climate transition, social changes, helping women throughout the world. Uh, technology won't replace the decision-making process, political decision-making process. What is important is to roll out uh, technologies. It's a highly political issue. It's a matter of politics. And uh, of course, it's a collective effort. It's a collective endeavor. This is something that is of critical importance. Liberal democracy need convergence, of course, regarding regulations, regarding rules, good practices when it comes to deploying artificial intelligence. By the way, artificial intelligence can be used in order to beef up efficiency, efficacy of resources, uh, to uh, further a uh, climate transition, but it can be used uh, f for fast fashion. So we need to lay out a framework, a shared common framework between Europe and the United States. In order to do that, we need to reduce the imbalances in the way we are provided information. So we can see that uh, companies would like to get a common framework, and they won't be able to survive if the differences are too big across the different markets. And I think that this is a significant point. We need to get a consensus uh, on the big principles that will be materialized, uh, taking into account uh, technological elements. There should be an alliance between liberal democracies. Ada, you wanted to add something. So I would like to ask uh, the same question as Fati. So you are committed, a commitment-based uh, adventure. Uh, of course, I mean, you've uh, testified for the cause of women. What was the triggering point? Why did you embark upon this path? I discovered the existence of uh, social uh, security in Chile. My her mother is uh, from Chile, and my father is Iranian. So I discovered uh, uh, what was social security because I got surgery for appendicitis. Uh, appendicitis. And you have uh, to give a blank check. And didn't know why it was OK, because I was born in France. And over time, in France, I realized that, that uh, you could enjoy schools, free libraries, hospitals in most uh, countries in the world, uh, that's not the case. I mean, it doesn't work like that in many countries uh, of the world. And uh, of course, I mean, I was aware, I became aware that I'm living in an outstanding place. And I wanted to tell what was happening in the world and a situation that was not good. but. Uh, when you compare yourself, I mean, you, f you, you, you feel more optimistic, and then you can contribute to improving the situation. And that's why I decided to do this job, and I decided to do this job in conflict areas and zones. Uh, you have uh, 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 terrible conflicts. And uh, from time to time, it's uh, matter of life or death. When I return to France, I'm very happy. Whatever the situation is, I'm very happy because I was born in a republic, and I'm very happy because I live in a liberal democracy.
Maybe uh, some questions uh, for our speakers. Somebody has raised uh, his hand at the back of a room. Maybe there are some roving mics. Gentlemen, go ahead. Is it possible for you to introduce yourself? And maybe you can ask a brief question. You need to get a mic. So speak into the mic, please. Uh, thank you, Mario. So, hi. I'm part of the youth delegation and created an association called Melting Pot, promoting education in popular districts and neighborhoods I come from Marseille, and I think that you can notice that through my accent. I have a question to put to you. According to you, what is the role of popular education in terms of people's education, young education? We are talking about schools, but uh, it's a threefold approach education, parents, and experience. And most of the time, uh, experience is left aside. People cannot really experiment. So we, uh, I want to know what is uh, your uh, take on that, a question for Fatty or for uh, Victor as well. So in a nutshell, I will give you a short answer. regarding diversity and training talent, different talent for technology, this is absolutely pivotal. This is not wishful thinking. I can tell you a story. When I arrived at Stanford at the end of the curriculum, we worked on projects with friends from China, from India, and as far as I'm concerned, I started to think with theories, and I thought about the model that could be used. And my colleagues, I mean, looked at the data in order to explore uh, the environment. There are different approaches in industry, in research. When you have a good team spirit, you can find new things. So for France, it's important to train people to train a wide array of uh, talent at all levels, PhD, masters, BAs. So, uh, Fati, what can you tell us? We have a question by Mrs. Moreno. So, uh, popular, popular cultures within education. Uh, people should be made accountable. Parents should be made accountable. They, you have uh, cultural and demographic segregation. But uh, we need to focus on the role of parents. I was fortunate to uh, travel uh, thanks to urban cultures. I went to the uh, favelas of Brazil. And uh, I didn't see young people uh, loot as schools and they decided to take ownership of their districts and neighborhoods despite uh, dire straits and conditions. So to make uh, people accountable and a young guy, I mean, who is in favor of the military service, we don't have too many young uh, people uh, such him. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for your words of hope. Uh, of course, I'm very happy with the uh, panel of uh, speakers. So we've uh, uh, just uh, gone through uh, terrible moments in my country, and I'm really uh, flabbergasted. So what do you think of these events, and what are the words of hope? We would like to get uh, country that is less uh, divided. We need to look at the people who provide uh, hopes. Uh, it's not simply a matter of uh, passing judgment of the people who have uh, looted lots of uh, places. What about these events? Uh, what is your perception? And what are the words of hope that we can give to people? Uh, of course, uh, as uh, the uh, minister said, uh, we were all uh, flabbergasted. 
Diversity is a huge opportunity. Any euro invested in education is a euro which is well invested in the long term. Of course, so we should refuse status quo and we need to focus on the future. As far as I'm concerned, I was in Nanterre. I was a reporter. Uh, convergence of fears. This is what I've observed. The fear of parents, uh, whatever their origins. So people being afraid of being arrested by uh, police forces, uh, scared by uh, people who uh, looted uh, some infrastructures, and the fear of the uh, police forces uh, law enforcement forces. The police forces are afraid of uh, controlling people and the situation will turn awry and they are afraid of being involved in a situation that could put their career in jeopardy, bringing about some irreparable damage. So lots of fears being concentrated on the same uh, territory. So there should be more bonds, more links between people. It might uh, seem uh, gullible and naive. I don't want to politicize the debate. And uh, local police forces have been removed. And in fact, uh, the links are looser now between the population and the police forces. Francoise, I was not surprised. But uh, what about values? Uh, I talked about uh, the school system. So basically, we've uh, halved the uh, size of classrooms, but that's not enough. Um, President, we need to make some efforts. When you uh, teach uh, values to young people at a very young age, it has a lasting impact, Fati. We need to take into account the context. So did you expect, I mean, this explosion of violence? Were you surprised? Yes, I was surprised, especially in France, in a country such as in other countries, the environment, the context is more hostile and they didn't uh, face uh, these uh, problems. So we are the country of enlightenment, so we don't want the power to be cut. So when we talk about delinquency, we are talking about young people who uh, drop out and they have substitutive or substitution families, hence some violence. Of course, we have uh, to invest. You talked about education. Education is key. We don't invest in programs because uh, when we don't invest for the future, we will pay the price later. Back to basics, in fact. So uh, we need to uh, focus on the school system. We need to understand young people, taking into account their social and individual context. So back to basics. So. Freedom, equality, fraternity. Thank you. Monsieur, vous aviez une question. Il vous faudrait un micro. You have a question. Do you want a mic? Can you introduce yourself? You can ask a brief question. Fred, I'm an acoustics vibration engineer, so I'm work at Airbus on the Super Puma, and I came to Marseille to work there, but it didn't last long. Why? Over the past 10 years, I was in custody in Paris, so I was uh, put in custody in Marseille by the special police forces. I'm working in the UK. Oh, I have to ask a question, but I wanted to introduce myself.
So I didn't want to leave Marseille. The question, please. So back to this idea. Rap. If we want uh, young people from the suburbs, it's not a question. Oh, I don't have any question, just a comment. Thanks a lot for contributing. There are some people who are eager to ask questions. A question in the first row. So two questions in a row, then we will be able to answer, and we will give a collective answer. I am a French person living in Las Vegas. You talked about the Iranian regime. You've said that it's a conservative regime. And for me, it's a fascist type of regime. It's a terrorist regime. What can we do practically in order to help out women and to help Iranians who are the heroes of freedom? What can we do? So let's listen to the second question that has been asked. Ronald Parade. Uh, I live in France in the sustainable uh, development uh, sector, working on earth, raw earth. So there are lots of hopes. So following uh, these uh, hopes that have been expressed, will there be an action plan? You will be given an answer in 10 minutes' time. So the best is yet to come. Jean-Hervé Lorenzi is a global breakdance dancer and is also the author of the manifesto. So you can uh, give him an answer. Question, est-ce qu'on peut faire à échelle 1 Well, there's two things to answer your question. First of all, individually, we must continue relaying this re revolution, conveying it with the scope it deserves. Let me remind you once again that this is the first feminist revolution in history, which is uh, uh, born by both men and women. So as media, we have uh, a lot to do. But as citizens, it's absolutely essential to continue contributing on social media in all ways we can. And at a more political level, the main demand of uh, Iranian opponents is that anyone uh, taking part in this regime that you aptly uh, described as a terrorist uh, and fascist uh, uh, regime should be for forbidden to uh, come to a European country. It's something complicated. France can't make that decision on, on its own. It's a decision that has to be made at the European level, at the EU level. But it's very important because we're talking about mullahs who are used to coming to the EU, to enjoying uh, the spirits that they forbid the youngsters to drink in their country, and they will hang them for that. And they come with their wives, members of the family, and uh, wearing garments that would lead to a condemnation in their countries. And it's important to pinpoint this paradox and this situation, which is unbearable for uh, Iranian people who can't go out. So the main thing would be to forbid for the members of this regime to come and have enjoy uh, the European uh, Union countries. One last question, and we'll listen to Françoise, uh, then to co for conclusion. Marion, there's a question in the first row. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm the mayor of Chateauneuf-le-Rouge, Michel Boulan. I used to be assistant for sports of this area. So, Fati, this is a question to you. With uh, uh, the mayors of uh, Aix-en-Provence, we have created a system called PRODAS. It's high-level sports coming to the uh, neighborhoods. We talked about school and culture, but we have to talk about sports. And I would like to know your opinion about this type of policy. Gardanne, Pertuis, Aix-en-Provence, Vitrolles were also involved. The city of Marseille wants to introduce this uh, action. What is your opinion on this policy of partnership with high-level sports uh, club? Uh, we uh, fund these clubs, we help them, so that they come to the neighborhoods and uh, uh, maybe uh, lead to some uh, new vocations. Fatih, 
Well, I know well the uh, municipal uh, context of X because Mrs. Joassin has asked me to participate uh, for two years. Uh, and I've known this place for over 20 years. I've also started working in Marseille as well, Prodas is in Marseille. I benefited from it. I believe that uh, associative policies or associations are uh, really have this type of uh, actions, and I would be in favor of that. I encourage these initiatives. I believe this, uh, that central policies, including the state, should be supported by the local elected authorities. This is very important because there are answers that cannot be given centrally to the local areas. It has to be bilateral, and I support and encourage this type of action. We did that in our sector of breakdance with uh, the first uh, federal uh, finals in the Grand Théâtre de Provence. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, breakdance started at the end of the 70s uh, in the Bronx, uh, and now it's in the Olympic Games, so we can do that. Thank you for the message. Well, this is the conclusion. Francois, over to you. Well, thank you, Francois. It won't be long because we were promised we'd have a surprise and would like to give time for this surprise. I'd like to pick up a quote without changing uh, the words. Ernst Bloch said, hope is not a belief, it's what makes us uh, get, a, uh, get ahead. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I in a moment, Jean Hervé is going to get up on stage to present the manifesto. But in uh, the, the moment, uh, Fatih, you give us the surprise. Dear friends, we'll go for lunch in a few minutes, but I wanted to do two things before that. I wanted to uh, get the whole organizing team of the Rencontre to come up on stage. Great team of 15 people. I will thank them later on, but can they please get up on stage? We have our president of the Cirque des Economistes here, and I'm asking the two vice presidents as well, Christian Boissieu and uh, Pelita Dasbis, to join us. And then we have uh, Mr. Muselier with us as well. Where are you? Where is Renaud Muselier? Mr. Joassin? Alors, si vous... Ah, le voilà. Le voilà. Here he is with us. Okay. Come, come, come. Please all come on stage. The whole team. The whole team from Rue Jean Mermoz. Can you come over? Hélène, hello. Come, come. Come here. Come here. Come with me. We wanted the team should be here as well. Could you please come to the stage? So first aspect, I will answer the question. What, what do we do with all this? Well, it's been like this for two and a half days. We've been sweating, sweating. It's quite boring after a while. No, it's amazing actually, but what's the point? Well, let me tell you. Until last year, in the 22 first sessions of the Rencontre Economique, we had a declaration of the Cercle. It was amazing, but nobody was interested from the outside. So we decided this year 
and uh, Renaud Kamea, Mrs. Uh, President Kamea, we've decided to to launch a manifesto. This manifesto will be distributed to you, hand over to you. I don't know what law is doing over there. Okay. Law, are we distributing? Okay, it is distributed. Okay, you go. Can you wave it? So you are 700 in two months time. Uh, we have to be 500,000. If we are 500,000, this manifesto will become the manifesto of the French people. And if it is so, it will, it will go from uh, you who are the base. So the sabbatic, it will go to the uh, highest authorities and uh, we'll have discussion in the country that will okay, 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 okay. that will we relaunch all the series of topics. So if you look at your document, not the blue part, but the uh, the, 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 the back, look, there are five proposals, five proposals, one, we, and we won't look at them all, but you will look at them. Five proposals that would make it possible to make our country move. That's why we, we, we need everybody to sign this. I want to say one, tell we one, and then I will let Renaud give you uh, a couple of good things about another one. And the third one will be our president who will say a word, but she talked a lot about school and everything is important. So first one, my friends, is that we're the only country in the world where there is 1.5 million young people who are completely desocialized. We call them the nerds. It makes no sense. Very much like you, they want to have la proper life conditions, work conditions, family conditions, but very much like you. So simply, our country for decades, we haven't been able to solve this problem. So there is a great expression. We commit ourselves to do our best. <laughs> I'm not asking for money. Well, if you want to give money, you know, I'll send you my, uh, my bank uh, re, uh, number. So simply consider that in five years, this uh, story of 1.5 million uh, young people who are excluded from society, that it should be done, finished. It, I, do you agree with that? That's not strong enough. Good. Renault. Well, OK, do you agree? Yes, OK. It works with them. All this is a result of, uh, of work, lots of work. Thank you all in this uh, day, which is going to be the hottest of the week, uh, past and future. Well, to be here for the closure, it's a great time, uh, which makes it possible to uh, to have a global dimension, European dimension, French, uh, close to the territory. So it's a major reflection available to all the citizens. And this is something essential. There is all series in the five proposals, which could all be used, but I will remain uh, attached to something, uh, train, education, youth, but also another dimension which has evolved in time, and uh, we see the difficulties in our country, citizenship, the, the fact that they belong to the country. So what do we or what can we take? So the military service being the, we cannot rethink it. Well, but I think uh, commitment in uh, associations, community groups, uh, you know, this is for the territory, for the region and the country. And so because we are in this context, and I think this aspect of citizenship is essential. There we go. So now our president. Third proposal, the rest in the manifesto, there is a key element, of course, on the, on the inclusion of education in the work in the labor contract, which provides the progression of individuals throughout their career, and especially when they reach a level which is not the one they would have wished, and they should have the perspectives they are entitled to.
So now, second stage, which is the thanks. You can imagine that this amazing system, everything you have for the last two and a half days doesn't fall from the sky. Amazing team again. First is based on the circles economist and I want to well be ready to applaud because uh, you need to applaud now. So two two key we say yes and then you applaud. First, thank you to our president. The Circle des Economists and the two vice presidents who represent the Circle des Economists. Now, those who organize the project, so I will just uh, name and thank on your behalf but you can applaud. You got the, the the hands ready. I will thank the bosses, and then after that, each of the bosses will thank their teams because the, we are non hierarchical system. So almost. First, I want to thank first and foremost each time the person can announce itself, the president of the board of director of this. Uh, Marie Castin. Okay, let's move on. Then a program, uh, you know, an exceptional program, amazing, which I think has really uh, raised the Rencontre Dex to a level they have, that never reached. All this was done by a team or the program team, you know, led by Clion Joubert. <laughs> then you notice that uh, you don't pay for the entry entrance. It's nice, isn't it? Well, once more, as for my, uh, for my, but simply because 125 businesses co-finance in full independence, there is no uh, some, you know. Uh, well, of course, we're an association, so this doesn't make sense. Of course, we will never sell ourselves to anybody, so. Hélène Verizer, congratulations. <laughs> made it possible to make, but she has a double talent. She organized the program for the youth, and as you could see, was they were omnipresent. Did you notice that in, in this beautiful uh, uh, program proposed by the mayor of Aix, the, the city hall of Aix, which is not here, but uh, well, under the high authority of, uh, of the president of the Région Sud, we got a physical organization, this, and the, 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 cano the canopies and everything is optional, okay? Microphones work, and Lorcum does all this. I can tell you great news. Lor have just told me that next year all the the all the uh, sites will be air conditioned. Well, not next year, the year after. Then, of course, all the, there is a Secretary General, Guillemette de Luz. And I will now uh, give the microphone to, I love talking, but uh, I give the microphone to each of the, uh, it's balanced in terms of uh, gender, a boy, five girls.
Five women. A, a man, five women. Jean Rivet, thank you. Th I want to thank the program team, uh, which uh, managed uh, 360 conference speakers and which coordinated the 67 sessions for the speakers Clément Lebourg, for the Elion de Paramont, Marie-Lou Gatineau. For coordination of sessions, uh, amazing work, Pauline Despi, Axel Amiro, Maxis Poussarda, and one missing on the stage, but Martino Guess, who did help us establish the program for months on. And I want to thank the communication team. Uh, and there we have Anne Biloli, who is the media director. Celia Azega and everything that had to do with social networks, virtual, and, uh, and the Hervé Schneider with Eloi Leroux and Julie Pagnon. Thank you. On my side, for the production of the event, I want to thank Pauline, who was uh, Thank you, Pauline. I want to thank Alexandra as well for the member of the circle. I want to have Anaïs on stage for everything that is housing. And come on stage, Anaïs. I do insist. Come on stage, Anaïs. I want to also call on stage, I think they're not here right now, Vincent and Olivia for transport. To th uh, we thank them anyway. Maxime, please, Maxime, come here, come with us. I want to thank uh, Cédric, Cédric and Frédéric, I don't know where they are, but thank you for your help. On my side, well, since we have to call people, I'll get uh, Laetitia from two teams, uh, two partner teams with Thomas and San Martin and Leticia as well, because uh, 125 partners, it's about uh, 700, uh, 800 people to manage. And for the youth, well, we'll call Chloe, uh, Chloe Racco, who supported uh, with Camille, the project manager, who managed 151, young one. We don't see them because they don't have their time watch, but they have a good, uh, uh, they, they got a full hour on their scarf, and they, Raise in the, your hand in the room, thank you. Secretariat General, I want to thank uh, Laetitia Deloin, who managed this. Uh, all the uh, white uh, shirts with Milia Vatra. First, I would like to support me for one thing, the fight for uh, fairness. I can't stay alone, so uh, it's not possible, so wait. Someone from Nicole Bordet, she's here, Nicole. Second point, you see that we were much uh, well, high numbers this year. We were 7,000 out of, uh, in the last two and a half days, 7,000 is not bad. And it will be 500,000 who will be on the internet. 500,000 on the internet. These are not all, you know, those are real figures. And also, I want to thank people who help us here. So on behalf of the Cercle, my two colleagues, Christian Boissieu, who played the key role yesterday, and of course, and uh, Badis, who was great. And of course, I won't come back to Francoise, but to, she's really enlightening this uh, community. I want to thank the service providers. So you don't have to hire them immediately, but if you hire them, you know, a little return for us on investment. First, 
under B communication uh, company. They're very good. There is Esquad, Crayon, Charlene and photographers, Camille, Elliot. That's communication. Now, for the technical providers who make it possible to organize it uh, day and night to finish the concert at midnight, 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, you got the red carpet and everything. Well, you all agree with the red carpet, okay, fine, so, because it's my one of my fights. So, I want to thank Boreal, you know, partner. A3 Production. Keep applauding. I got about 20 to go, so. By the way, I want to say, we didn't think the white shirts, you know, over there. And I want to thank the administration because we had the legal issue, you know, about the white shirts. And if you don't mind, and thanks to the Prefet de Région, Mirmo, all this has been solved in a friendly atmosphere. Then, You've noted that uh, his English is perfect, <laughs> and his team, Japanese, Chinese, and uh, Aviso events. Le Cruz, of course, Le Cruz. Yes, that's right, great, that's great. Le Cruz. Le Cruz, you know, you had the, uh, you know, the Cruz wasn't great when we were, yeah, you know, the trays. Now the Cruz is what you had, it's brilliant. You know, it's luxury food, you know, the course. Hélène Traiteur, well, nothing to say. Yeah, this is the top. Uh, Exio, well, maybe a word. They, they do... Olivier is a man do, oh, called Olivier. Olivier Vouzet. Olivier Vouzet clearly deserves your... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see my fight for fairness. Olivier Rousier is the one who think with the team, who think about the development, the, um, the amenities, and it's great. We, it's superb. Amizo Rousier. Transport, SSK, SCH Council, and Analik Viano, who is, the, uh, is over there. Crayon Reprography, Magali Antoine Sami for the assistance, IT support. Manifesto, our manifesto, the one you will advocate for this, this summer. Just ask. Uh, you say 1,000 people, you know, 1,000 people, 1,500, sir. Five, 500 each as 1,000 signature will reach our objective. It so happened that two young uh, person did, did, did help, Aladi Elliot, and I want to uh, thank them, Alan and Elliot. Timekeepers, they come back every year, they're great. And Theodore, Kevin, Emma as well. Arnaud and Clara, they're great, all of them. Special mention, I don't know if you've seen uh, a woman, very elegant, young, elegant woman, who was walking around, especially with a calm a boy, who was, you know, who could give me like Zomil every three minutes, our friend Lea Jenison. Last point, 
uh, applaud yourselves, not us, you, because honestly, without you, we would not be here. And the rest is true, too. C'est bon. Vas-y, vas-y, un petit mot, peut-être. Hein? Ah oui, pour toi. Moi, je voulais remercier Jean-Hervé parce que sans lui, je peux vous dire qu'aucun... Thank you to Jean-Hervé, because without him, nothing would be visible. See you next year. 3, 4, 5 July. July, anyway.